Straining, Mr. Curtis Manchun, Chairman of the Board of Governors, University of Trinidad and Tobago, Dr. Fazal Ali, Acting President and Provost, Trinidad, U University of Trinidad and Tobago, Mr. Chris Moody, Membership Coordinator of the American College Personnel Association, Mrs. Merritt Henry, International Coordinator of the American College Personnel Association, Mr. Philip Robinson, President of the CTLPA, the Caribbean Tertiary Level Personnel Association Regional, Mrs. Allison Logie Eustace, President of the CTLPA Trinidad and Tobago Chapter, Executive Members of the CTLPA, Members of the CTLPA, Members of the Media, Ministry Personnel, Participants, welcome and a pleasant good morning to you. We'd like to uh, introduce you to the panel that you see before you and take an opportunity to thank you from the onset for making the time to be here today. This is the Caribbean Tertiary Level Personal Association's fifth breakfast seminar and uh, we have a really wonderful lineup for you starting with some official remarks from our minister, from members of the University of Trinidad and Tobago, and from our very own CTLPA uh, regional and local chapter. And then we have two thought-provoking presentations. So I ask you to just sit back, um, relax, and take in all the information that will be provided to you here today. I'd move straight into the program by inviting Mr. Philip Robinson, uh, president of the CTLP Regional to bring greetings from the association. Thank you. Thank you, Christy. Senator the Honorable Fazal Karim, Minister of Tertiary Education and Skills Training. Mr. Curtis Manchun, Chairman of the Board of Governors, University of Trinidad and Tobago, Dr. Fazal Ali, Acting President and Provost, the University of Trinidad and Tobago, Mr. Chris Moody, Membership Coordinator, American College Personal Association, Ms. Merritt Henry, International Coordinator, American College Personal Association, Ms. Allison Logie Eustace, President, Caribbean Tertiary Level Personal Association, Trinidad and Tobago Chapter, Executive members of the CTLPA, members of the CTLPA, distinguished colleagues in student affairs. Good morning and welcome. Good morning and welcome. I will keep my comments rather brief since I'm acutely aware that nobody came here to listen to me. So to move the program along, I will keep my comments very brief. Just last evening, I returned from Tobago after conducting some business there on behalf of my university, the University of Trinidad and Tobago. And every time I come into contact with students, I'm reminded how critically important the role that we play as student affairs personnel really is. Sometimes the reminders are very vocal, as we, as we see from time to time in the national media. To its credit, to the credit of the CTLPA, Trinidad and Tobago chapter, which, was, which became a chapter in 2008. This is, the fifth, this is the fifth symposium or workshop that has been mounted by, by the association here in Trinidad. And they have covered some really, really interesting and important topics, like the, the role of student affairs in the accreditation process, uh, the first year experience, especially as it is relevant to the new students, the new cohorts that are entering our colleges and universities, uh, learning reconsidered, that is, the role of the student affairs professional in the overall scheme of things, in the overall framework of tertiary education within our institutions. A lot of times the focus is on the academics, but the student affairs professionals are in fact as well educators, because we, we treat with the issues and the education that takes place outside of the classroom. Uh, competency areas for student affairs professionals. And then today, critically important, retention, student retention. Now I became involved in the CTLPA 
in, in 2007, and quite by chance, and I gave this story at the Christmas function, which most of you did not attend, so it would not be a case of um, just repeating something that everyone knows. There was a workshop. At that time, we did not have an existing chapter in Trinidad and Tobago. And there was a workshop at the Emerald Plaza, and I was asked by one of my colleagues at UTT to drop off a box with some material for the workshop. So in essence, I was a delivery boy that day. I went upstairs, dropped off the box, and left. I did not know what the nature of the deliberations were or who was involved. At that time, however, I had become somewhat disillusioned with the disconnect between executive management at institutions that had worked and the student affairs professionals. I'd become disillusioned with the level of disconnect between the academics and the student affairs professionals. I'd become disillusioned with the, with the disconnect between executive management and the student body. So I myself was looking for a place, for a home, for somewhere where I could be in contact, where I could network with other persons who were experiencing similar challenges. I became then involved in the CTLPA from that point, and now I'm the president of the regional association, the, the association on a, on a regional level. So as I stand before you, I'm not looking at you as a bunch of delivery people. I'm looking at you as the future leaders of the association, future leaders in terms of our field, our, our work here in Trinidad and Tobago and certainly in the Caribbean. I want to just do a, one, take one moment to advertise our upcoming conference in June, from June 10th to 13th in Barbados. We have an annual conference. It will be the 16th annual conference of the CTLPA in Barbados, and the venue will be the Hilton Barbados. So it gives the opportunity for those of us who have valid contributions to make to come share our ideas, present papers, and in many instances, some of these ideas are implemented, become part of the, ed the tertiary education landscape. In thanks, I would want to firstly thank the Honorable Minister, who has through not only thoughts and words, but through deeds and tangible action, supported the work of the CTLPA here in Trinidad and Tobago. Dr. Chris Moody and the ACPA, the American College Personal Association, thank you very much for continuing to share your expertise and showing us the best practices, the, the, the best ways of addressing the, the challenges that face us on a day-to-day -day basis here. Uh, UTT, the University of Trinidad and Tobago has been extremely supportive, not only in terms of assisting with facilities and, and, and technology and so on, but also in terms of the support that the university gives to its, its uh, student affairs personnel and by, 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 um, by all means all, member of, all members of staff to participate and to be, become involved in associations that will help to uplift the work that they do. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, I can announce this morning that a memor memorandum of understanding has been drafted for a collaboration between the CTLPA and UDT to engage in professional development for student affairs personnel in Trinidad and Tobago. That memorandum of, of understanding will be signed shortly and in partnership with UDT, the CTLPA will be conducting a number of workshops, seminars, and so on to uplift and upgrade the skills of our student affairs personnel. And of course, to all participants and the institutions that have facilitated your presence, thank you for, for coming. May you derive what you have come here to get, and may your expectations be fulfilled. Thank you.
thank you, Mr. Robinson. Now you have no doubt why he's the president of the regional association. Um, certainly you raised some key points here. One, the critical role for student affairs personnel in embracing the concept that he alluded to called learning reconsidered. It's a movement away from just the pure hardcore education into embracing different facets of learning beyond the academics. And so we want to invite those of you here today, members and potential members, to take advantage of all that the CTLP has to offer in a, an effort to materialize the kind of information and put it out there, mobilize it, uh, so that we could become efficient serv student services providers. Without further ado, I'd like to call to the podium Mr. Uh, sorry, uh, Mrs. Allison Logie Eustace, president of the Trinidad and Tobago CTLP chapter. Good morning, everyone. On behalf of Trinidad and Tobago, local chapter of the CTLPA, I wish to welcome you all to our fifth annual seminar. I would like to particularly welcome our Minister of Tertiary Education, Science and Technology, the Honorable Minister, Sen the Honorable Senator Minister Fazal Karim, for taking the time to be here with us and championing our cause. Mr. Chris Moody, our feature speaker from the American University, is the Assistant Vice President of Campus Life. He co-chairs the ACPA International Member Advisory Board along with Ms. Merritt Henry from the University of the West Indies, Mona Campus, who is also here with us today. I wish to welcome the acting president and provost of UTT, Mr. Curtis Manchun, chairman of the board of governors of UTT, dignitaries from other tertiary institutions, and all of our special guests. I would like for us to take a few moments to reflect on why we are gathered here today while I recite our local chapter pledge. We, the members of the CTLPA, promise to promote the well-being of students, to engage, involve, and develop both students and our fellow membership to appreciate diversity, to facilitate the merging of both in-class and out-of-classroom learning that would create greater student satisfaction and Caribbean leaders. It is with this in mind that our membership agreed on the title of our seminar, Student Retention. Once our students' well-being is preserved, their sense of belonging to their particular institution has been reinforced, increased retention should be achieved. We are here to talk, share, and learn the many challenges and proven theories on student retention. At the end of the day, it is my hope that we will all leave here with some relevant information that will help us to be better educators, administrators, and student affairs practitioners. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Logie Eustace, um, our local president. Uh, and I, I want to extend a special thanks for your leadership, Madam President, in mean, putting this wonderful workshop together. So commendations to yourself and members of the executive. I'd like to invite Mr. Curtis Manchun, Chairman of the Board of Governors of UTT, to open with some welcoming remarks.
Thank you, Madam Chairperson. Senator the Honorable Fazal Karim, Minister of Tertiary Education and Skills Training. Uh, my fellow Chairman, Mr. Chanda Gupasad, C. Pasad, Chairman of YTEP. Uh, Dr. Fazal Ali, Provost and Acting President of the University of Trinidad and Tobago. Mr. Chris Moody, featured speaker here this morning and Director of Membership Development at the ACPA College. Mr. Philip Robinson, President, Caribbean Tertiary Level Personal Association. Ms. Alison Logie Eustace, President of the Trinidad Chapter. Ms. Alicia Ali, Accreditation Council of Trinidad and Tobago. Christy Smith, the University of the West Indies. Specially invited guests, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, and on behalf of the Board of Governors of the University of Trinidad and Tobago, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you this morning to this, the fifth symposium of the Caribbean Tertiary Level Personal Association. Still a little bit of a tongue twister to me. I heard it rolling off the lips of Philip. But uh, welcome, and may I as well add my congratulations on your fifth uh, symposium. Last year, I believe, I had the opportunity for the first time of uh, addressing you and being here, and I'm happy to be here once again this morning. It is no secret that the Caribbean Tertiary Level Personal Association fosters the timely development of a student-centered culture throughout tertiary education institutions across the Caribbean. For many years, tertiary education had been solely concerned with the process of teaching, paying little or no attention to the students' learning in the classroom. The CTLPA is therefore making its mark to assist us to be trailblazers in tertiary education so that we might capitalize on a truly student-centered mindset. I'm pleased to see that through the CTLPA and other similar organizations, the paradigm shift is taking place where the student becomes our chief stakeholder and is kept at the forefront of our consciousness. As I looked through these notes last night and looked at your website and recalled uh, last year's event, I thought about the fact that, that really this is part of a broader, if you wish, global movement and consciousness that it's, it's really all about service to others, it's not about us. And many years ago, the great marketing guru out of Harvard, Theo Levitt, uh, changed the face of marketing when he made the famous statement that when someone walks into a hardware and asks for a quarter-inch drill, he doesn't really want a quarter-inch drill, but he's looking for a quarter-inch hole. And so as we think about all of these stakeholders involved in tertiary education, it's interesting that we sometimes lose focus of what is most important and really our raison d'etre, which, which are the students. And so we have to remind ourselves that our primary focus, the reason that we are here, is because of these students. And at UTT, at the University of Trinidad and Tobago, in terms of our rationale and our formation, our foundation, we probably want to go a little bit further beyond that and to ask ourselves uh, with these students, is it when students come to a university, are they coming simply at the end of the course of their studies to get a piece of paper which states that they have graduated, or are they coming for something much more? Of course, our mission as an entrepreneurial university is to spawn entrepreneurs to develop business to contribute to the economic development of Trinidad and Tobago. And indeed, that's a global challenge. And I think students, if we go beyond, if we, if we, if we, if we uh, use Theodore Levitt's statement a little bit more, students want to live a successful life after they have graduated with everything that is involved in that. And work and career is not only part of that. As we look at our society, uh, people struggle with all kinds of issues so that our remit is broadened not only to ensure that they graduate successfully from a course of academic studies, 
but indeed that they are well prepared to face life, to face life success successfully, and to make a meaningful contribution to our society and indeed our world. Today, our, our, our topic is that of student retention and its role towards improving graduation rates, which will be addressed by our featured speaker. As tertiary practitioners, we are aware that there are unique circumstances which lead to low student retention. The question remains, however, now that we have the student, how do we keep him or her? While high intake student numbers should translate into high graduation statistics, there may be exceptionally high or low rates of retention for individual institutions. Given Trinidad and Tobago's accessibility to gate funding, this phenomenon may be all the more puzzling for many of us. So today, ladies and gentlemen, we anticipate the delivery of our featured speaker, Mr. Chris Moody, as he shares with us on this intriguing topic that has many ramifications for all tertiary level institutions represented here today. For us to be trailblazers in tertiary education and to truly aspire to that of having a student-centered mindset, we must understand our students, assess their needs, and adjust our methods of delivery to their benefit. These are all mechanisms that we are currently employing and exploring at UTT. As the Entrepreneurial University and the National University of Trinidad and Tobago, UTT's role as a tertiary provider is integral to the development of our nation and its human capital. We have the important task of producing work-ready graduates but before we can achieve this end result, we must first retain the students who enter our 10 teaching campuses annually. Let me take this opportunity to declare UTT's support for the CTLPA, which is led by its president, Mr. Philip Robinson, manager of student services at UTT. And as Philip indicated, UTT will be deepening its partnership with the CTLPA through the Memorandum of Understanding for professional development for you here today. Philip, as well as other members of UTT's staff who have served in an executive capacity with the CTLPA continue to make us proud through this important alliance. And we certainly encourage it, endorse it, and support it at the level of the Board of Governors. So in closing, I want to congratulate the CTLPA, all of you, Philip and his team, for once again putting on this symposium and to wish you all the very best in your continued deliberations and in the very important work that you continue to do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Manchun. And you raised two very important points here. One, the analogy you drew um, alluded to the notion of critical thinking. And it also uh, spoke about a kind of flexibility that we as student services personnel, and I'd move further to say tertiary level personnel, must embrace um, in order to contend with the new students that we're facing. And another um, key point is the accreditation versus knowledge and experience. Is the student coming to your higher education institution simply for that piece of paper? Or is it that we need to make the experience one that encourages them to come back? When they come back, they embrace further concepts at the higher level and then they're able to translate that into the society. So I want you to ponder on the words uh, Mr. Manchun shared with us, because I think it's, it's critical to even our own um, interaction with our students. Before we bring Minister to uh, share his remarks, I'd like to invite Mrs. Merritt Henry. Mrs. Henry uh, is the international coordinator of the ACPA, but she's here today bringing greetings from the Jamaica chapter uh, in which she's a member. Ms. Henry. Thanks very much, Ms. Smith, Ms. Christa Smith. Uh, Senator the Honorable Fazel Karim, Minister of Tertiary Education, 
acting president and provost of UTT, Dr. Curtis Manchun, Mrs. Alison Logie Eustace, president of the Trinidad and Tobago chapter of CTLPA, Mr. Philip Robinson, president of the Caribbean Tertiary Level Personnel Association, Mr. Chris Moody of ACPA. And let me also recognize in the audience past president of CTLPA, Mr. Shandar Supersad and Mr. Curtis Mike. Um, colleagues all in the audience. Mine is the honor and pleasure to bring you greetings this morning from the Jamaica chapter of CTLPA. However, before I do so, I would like to congratulate Trinidad to join with the others on the platform and congratulate Trinidad and Tobago on hosting this conference seminar today. You see, I'm upgrading it to a conference. It's looking as if we are going to be having just that today. On, um, I'm, cert I'm certain that we will all be leaving here learning something new about how we can help our students to, to achieve. I would not only like to bring you greetings from Jamaica chapter of CTLPA, but to bring you greetings from CTLPA Caribbean, because CTLPA is represented in probably about seven or eight other Caribbean um, regions or islands, although the numbers might be small. And although Mr. Moody would be talking to you about ACPA, I would also like to just tell you that we are a part of ACPA and we are proud, proud as Mr. Supersad and others will tell you, that we are the first to be commissioned an international division of AC, ACPA. And we all, let us not feel ourselves apart from the 28 other countries outside of the USA that um, have joined to be members of ACPA, which is saying that um, certainly there is something good about this association, which represents over 8,000 um, persons across the world. Now, in bringing you greetings, I would like to say that, and to remind you, because I know you know already, that the world of work is changing. There are demands, changing demands, and we have to, and we have been changing the way we approach teaching our students. What they learn outside the classroom is as important as what they learn inside the classroom. The, World of work is demanding that students now have more of the soft skills, the interpersonal skills, the communication skills, um, the, the way they dress, the way they do their interviews, and all these things that are must go to com complement what happens in the classroom. And ladies and gentlemen, you are the persons who present these and help students to develop these skills and competencies. So we want you to think of yourselves as professionals. And I'm hoping that everyone sitting here this morning, if you are not yet a member of CTLPA, that you are going to try to become a part of that big body of professionals internationally who are helping students to succeed. That you are also going to become a part of ACPA, which is our international body. I personally have benefited from being a member of ACPA when I joined as a career development person at the University of the West Indies, Mona. I was the only person on the island who was um, trained in career development and was actually practicing in career development. So I had to find, there were other counselors, but there were guidance counselors who were working in the high schools, which of course I was a member when I worked in the high school of the Guidance Counselors Association. That did not meet my needs anymore when I moved into the tertiary level or higher education. So I had to seek guidance elsewhere and I went to ACPA. And since then I have grown to professionally and otherwise, so I'm encouraging you all to do, to, do, to do so, because seeing that the demands of the students are changing, we must be prepared to meet their needs, and we have to continue to 
um, to invest in ourselves and in lifelong learning. I was told before I, start, before I started that I should be brief, and then afterwards I was told that I should be brief, brief, and then afterwards I was told that I should be very, very brief. So therefore I think I should um, conclude my, 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 well, my um, presentation or my um, greetings this morning and just to wish for you all a very good day. Thank you, Mrs. Henry, and I just want to draw to the audience's attention, Mrs. Henry is also a founding member of the CTLPA, so she um, has the in-depth knowledge of the genesis of this particular institution. To do the address and formal opening, I'd like to invite the Senator, the Honorable Fazal Karim, Minister of Tertiary Education and Skills Training. Thank you very much, Ms. Christy Smith, our chairperson for this morning, as well as our presenter from UWI. Mr. Philip Robinson, the president of CTLPA. Mrs. Allison Logie Eustace, president of the CTLPA as well. I'm seeing both of you. I hope you're both presidents. Local chapter and the Caribbean chapter respectively. Mr. Curtis Manchun, Chairman of the University of Trinidad and Tobago, Dr. Fazal Ali, Acting Provost and President of UTT, Ms. Alicia Ali, Presenter from the Accreditation Council of Trinidad and Tobago, Mr. Chandar Gupta Supersad, while he's in his capacity here as well today from UWI, we recognize him as the Chairman of YTEP, the Youth Training Employment Partnership Program Limited, Mrs. Merritt Henry, International Coordinator of ACPA, Mr. Chris Moody, Director of Membership Development, ACPA, College Students Educators. Representatives of the TLIs who are here with us this morning, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen. As I was coming into this facility this morning, and I know that as I stand here, it seems to me like it's just last week I was here in a similar environment, in the identical environment, maybe with not the identical faces, but I'm sure many of you were here as well last year. It is indeed an honor for me to bring opening remarks for your workshop this morning, and I thank you for the invitation. The theme of today's seminar is student retention towards improving graduation rates. This is an important aspect of tertiary education, of higher learning. Student retention is something that we must all take very seriously since it represents significant investment not only by those who invest in the institutions to which students attend, but also investment of the students themselves in their future. As I looked at this theme, I immediately wanted to find out what are the countries with the highest graduation rates in the world? My research led me to six countries who are the holders of these highest graduation rates. They include number six, Ireland with 43.9%. Fifthly, New Zealand with 47.3%. In fourth place, Japan, 53.7%. Thirdly, Russia with 55.5%. Secondly, South Korea with 55.7% and very close to us, Canada with 57.8%. First student retention, I recall as well my days at the University of the West Indies, which I will give you in my own view what I think contributes to some extent to student retention. But permit me because I'm involved not only in terms of the sector of tertiary education and higher education, permit me to also offer some advice to the association in terms of how you move forward. I think in the world of qualifications, 
and building portfolios. It is important that not only do we have professional development sessions and workshops like these, but it is important in my view for us to ensure that all of these institutions and by extension programs that we attend move towards some measure of crediting our attendance towards the qualification. I am saying that because of the context of a qualification that I had the pleasure and the honor to build as a part of a team in the Caribbean, and it is called the Caribbean Vocational Qualification. The Caribbean Vocational Qualification is a work-based competency-oriented qualification. And therefore, when I asked the question earlier on, whether we have any qualifications, any certification, any knowledge intensive programs in Trinidad and Tobago for people, persons like you to become true professionals, not that you're not true professionals, I'm talking about in the award of qualifications, I'm advised that the only qualification closest to us is at the master's level at the University of the West Indies, Mona, Jamaica. While we complement our institution in Jamaica, I think the time has come for us to offer that qualification in Trinidad and Tobago. I am aware of the ease of process for approval through the University of the West Indies, where programs, once they are approved at one campus, could find it very easy to be approved at another campus. Also here at the University of Trinidad and Tobago, I listened to Mr. Robinson who was saying that he's going to sign very shortly an, a memorandum of agreement. And therefore, we'll want to ensure that we have articulation at the professional level, from certificate to degree to postgraduate, and even postgraduate diploma. I told you earlier on that it is my view as well that all of these sessions that you attend should be credited towards some qualification. In the context of the world of learning, sometimes people refer to that as prior learning assessment and recognition. Or in some other countries, it is simply called PLA, prior learning assessment. While in other countries, it is called APL, accreditation of prior learning. Many of you, and if not all of you, would understand very easily what I'm speaking about. If you were to determine that all of these workshops and conferences that you have, and particularly in the context of workshop, which might have a different context to the conference, that these things are deliberate and they can go towards the development of a module of some sort, then we can say that if you would have attended a workshop of X hours, it will, it will accrue towards Y credits, etc. I believe, my dear colleagues on the head table, and members of the executive, if you were to do that, not only would you find increased numbers in your membership, but you will certainly find increased attendance at your workshops. What it will mean as well is that where you are in your respective countries, for example here, for those who would sacrifice and attend, you are going to be building that portfolio towards your qualification. And now I indicate to you that for many universities and higher education institutions, the whole aspect of student retention means striving to increase the number of full-time students enrolled per year without losing too many. As a former teacher myself, I am very much aware of the distinction between registration, enrollment, attendance, graduation, Retention, which might come before graduation, and certainly another aspect of retention, the dropout rate or the fallout rate. I had asked Mr. Robinson while we were talking just now casually, whether you have any document, whether you have any publication of all of these workshops. And he says, yes, that we have these publications. But I think maybe the time has come for you to compile research information coming out of your workshops and your conferences. I think you must take this to the next level 
that your association must be the embodiment of not only the acquisition of knowledge, skills, aptitudes, and abilities, but also how do you consolidate your learning and transfer that knowledge to others in the field? Why is it impossible? And I ask you, what is the backward linkage with you as a professional and those who want to enter the profession? And I can tell you that, in my own estimation, there may be very little. And if you do not have that backward links, for example, are you sufficiently aware or do you make others aware as to what this profession involves? I notice in your strategic objectives, you talk about public education. I want to compliment you for that. And in fact, very soon I'll be asking, I have asked Mr. Manchun already, through the University of Trinidad and Tobago, to launch the national knowledge network called Learn TT. Learn TT will be the national knowledge network that we can place on the media, that we can have national television, which will build the human capacity of Trinidad and Tobago. Currently, in the tertiary sector, we have a participation rate of about 42.5%. And the target is that by 2015, we'll want to attain, if not exceed, the 60% participation rate in the tertiary sector. And therefore, it is important as well, as you not only inculcate those values and those beliefs and those mores of your profession, that you instill those into those who you come into contact with. While I was sitting down there, I was thinking about what I should say to you that you do. Maybe you know it already. And I just wrote down, in my view, one of the things that you do is that you are touching lives and that you are changing the future. I say that too because as practitioners in this field, you have your own sui generis. And your sui generis, in my view, can also be described as in loco parentis, in the place of the parent. Very many times, sometimes when I spoke with Mr. Supersad on the campus when I work as business development manager, we'll meet at the student advisory services. And while we're talking about meet and greet, and I recognize as well meet and greet when my daughter went to Georgetown University, we didn't even know anything about Washington, D.C. And I saw the importance of that program, and I commended the UWI, and I'm sure the UTT and all, all other members will have that. Could you imagine the bewilderment when a student enters a new geographic space, a new country, and doesn't know where to go for what answers? That in itself might be your first statistic of student withdrawal and lack of retention, because people may be so intimidated by the, the, in the receiving environment that if they do not get that first impression right, they may not be interested in continuing. And therefore, as I say to very many, you do not have a second opportunity to have a first impression. You will provide not only in some cases the assistance for housing, the assistance as well, as I indicated in my discussion with Mr. Supersad, even of taking money out of your own pockets to assist our students. I always say that those who do good not only will reap the rewards here, but you will certainly reap the rewards of the place that you will go higher than here. I often tell people that we are in this job not on a vacation, but we are here by virtue of a vocation. This is a calling. You must have a heart for other people if you truly want to impact on the quality of their lives. I think I will just put away my speech and talk to you as I know best from the experiences of my own life. I want to also indicate that for me and for you, I believe that student retention must also be informed by not only the interests of the student in what they're doing, where they're doing, but through you, by your own interests in the student. So we have a double responsibility, the student's own interests in pursuing their goals and objectives where they are, but also your professional acumen in terms of creating that interest in the student by what you do. I want to also ask you, 
that to ensure that the experience, and that is what it is, when we study, picture yourselves, you seated here today, when you would have been a student in the tertiary sector, that as you look back today, you will remember and you will recall, maybe fondly in some cases, and not so fondly in other cases, your own student experience. That will want you to return to that institution to do your postgraduates, or certainly will want to encourage you, to encourage your child, your children, or your relatives to go to get that experience that you, had, you would have acquired. I think it is not only a case, we should not only see student retention from the percentage of persons who will graduate. We must also see student retention in terms of those who will be retained or will retain themselves in the institution beyond graduation, that they will serve in other capacities the institution that they would have benefited from. But I want to also ask you to see student retention from the predisposition period of entering the institution. That is, how does an institution retain the percentage of enrollment and before that registration of students in your institution? This is a business. If you have no students, then you have no retention. And retention is not only about the students, it's about retention of the staff as well, about what you are and what you do, and the faculty. There were just among the things that we would have in terms of improving that experience will be that entire teaching learning experience. That teaching learning experience has to come from that personal interface with that person who is delivering that lesson, who is delivering that curriculum. And therefore it is important for us to have the facilities and the amenities to create that learning environment, that rich enabling environment, without which you will not have continuity or the retention of students who will want to continue that program with you. As a matter of fact, you will hear students assessing their lecturers, their professors, their teachers, even from day one. So while you're assessing your students in terms of the marks they make, they're assessing you in terms of your antics, in terms of your behavior, in terms of your disposition, in terms of your knowledge. I remember one teacher telling me once, he says he was teaching a sixth form geography class. And he did not do geography at his degree. But he was faced with a question that he could not answer. And the escape route was, when we get to that lesson, we will answer that question. And therefore, I suppose these are different strategies we use. I want to ask you as well, in diagnosing the problems that you might encounter or face, that you must learn to listen first before you prescribe. Because that is important. Sometimes people know that you cannot solve their problems, but they want a listening ear. I did tell you that in some cases, like in the case of the parent that you are now placed in, in local parentis, that you do not understand, or maybe sometimes we take for granted, where our students come from. And our student here is not necessarily those persons who have just exited the secondary school system. Our students could also be working men and women, single parents, divorced marriages, all of these, and you have to be very alert to them. And therefore, in my view, it is important for us not only to lend a listening ear and to listen well to diagnose. And that's one of the problems we have. We tend to want to prescribe solutions too quickly before understanding and diagnosing the problem properly. And therefore, I want to also ask you, not only to see that individual person in front of you, but to find out and to investigate the background of that problem. It is important as well to do, as we say, your background checks. What are the social and fam family issues that may, that may bring to bear to you what exists in front of you? I want to also say that in all of this, please consider this aspect not necessarily of religion, but of spirituality, of spiritual development. That to me is very central in terms of how we build character 
as opposed to how we build personality. Personality is like form. Character is like class. It is permanent. Personality can be adapted to the environment in which you are or you meet someone, but your character withstands your test of time. I want to also ask you to consider our economy and to ensure that at all times that you don't have the perpetual student who has become domiciled in the institution, but you advise them in terms of what the economy requires, the workforce requires. I have come across a wonderful book which I can recommend to you. It is called The Shift, S-H-I-F-T. The Future of Work is Already Here by Professor Linda Grattan of the London Business School. You can also read Jim Clifton, The Coming Jobs War, and you will understand what we are talking about. You have to be not only prepared to deal with the social, psychological issues of that person in front of you, but you have to be a jack of all trades. You have to be very widely knowledgeable of all aspects of our economy. And therefore, you must be able to, if somebody were to come to you and say, listen, I would like to change my program of study. You must know what is at the outcome in terms of the graduation, in terms of what employment opportunities there are. We have heard about these terminologies regularly, continuous learning, life-wide learning, lifelong learning. But then you must also advise them that there's a time that the learning continues, but the earning must also start. There's a time that you must move from learning to earning while you continue to learn where you are. And therefore, I want to also say that one of the instances, and particularly as we look around the Caribbean and the world at large, that we are concerned about is the whole stigma of security or lack of security or the detection of problems long before they happen. It is becoming too commonplace now for us to look at the cable television and see that some student picks up a gun and kills innocent people. You might not be able to detect that, but certainly you might be in the better position than anybody else to detect that in the way in which you will speak or inquire or in as we engage in discovery learning of our clients. I think I can go on, but I think this morning is not my morning to go at length. I think I just wanted to share some of those things with you. I want to also indicate as well that some of the issues that we face are what we call coping skills of our students. Sometimes they come to the higher education institutions. And I would love your association to engage in different study. And I want to say if you take up the challenge, as I want to ask you to take up a study in terms of student participation, retention, and graduation, that my ministry will support that study. I want to ask you as well that if you look at the impact of student coping with academia, that those are studies, you must create your own directory of research that will be very useful. Research which through your association, as I indicated in building the qualification, that people can be credited. And therefore, when you look at the whole aspect of coping skills, as I said, sometimes you, you may ask the question of a student, if you were to take a random survey at persons in first year university and you ask them, why did you join this degree program? Why did you engage in this course of study? You may find a certain percentage that may say, that my friend who I came from high school is doing this and we come here together. You may also hear them say that I did not get my first or my second or my third choice. This is my fourth choice. Do you know what that means for someone getting a fourth choice and going through three years of study? That's why we are seeing not only the retention rate of students, we are seeing the repeat rate of students. Students who are repeating first degrees as opposed to going into postgraduate. You, look, you read about the college course calamity in the United States of America. We are very fortunate in Trinidad and Tobago. The government assistance for tuition expenses continues, and I want to say unreservedly, that the GATE program has been secured and expanded. And I do not want anybody to have any other perception this government continues to hold fast to the GATE program to facilitate the building of our brain power among our young and not so young. And therefore, I also want to indicate to you 
that one of the things that will encourage student retention is the opportunity and the facility for them to come up with great ideas and to succeed while right where they are. You look at some of those persons who have made it in the world of technology, and people are reading that they will drop out from their schools, their universities, and they are multi-billionaire. Well, they may have dropped out to start a business because at the time the institution did not provide the resources or the welcoming environment to develop that idea. Many people wake up in the morning after a night's sleep with a bright idea, with a dream, and I mean literally a dream. Some people dream formulas, some people dream ma machines, but what do they do with those dreams? What are our institutions of higher learning providing for us when we wake up with that dream to say, well, you can go to this innovation facility. You can go into that classroom there where there's a, a professor of innovation and creativity and invention and take it forward. My dear friends, we must move the innovation and creativity agenda from rhetoric to reality. We must stop only talking about it. We must start doing something about it. And the time has come for us. Because when you do that, not only are you going to have students continue on their programs because they're now excited by the learning experience, but you will have them continuing in your institutions. And you will also have a feedstock waiting to enter institutions because you are building a great brand. If you do not answer your question, someone else will answer it for you. And in that context, it will be your competitor. I wish to congratulate all of you. I wish to congratulate the CTLPA. And also, I wish to, to pray Almighty God's blessings for the success. And I hope you will take up the very many challenges I've given to you. I want to ask a request of you as well. And that is we have now launched our two state-of-the-art jobs and career coaches. Nothing you would have ever seen in any part of this world like that. I am boasting about it. The Ministry of Tertiary Education and Skills Training has two state-of-the-art buses, mobile facilities built in China, outfitted here in Trinidad and Tobago as well, where we have workstations, Wi-Fi, YouTube, Facebook, and we have workstations where you can have one-to-one -one counseling. And therefore, I want to ask the association to ensure as well that we can have you, through your association, provide that measure of social responsibility. And I want to also ask that if you are doing community hours like that, that you must also be credited for your valuable time spent. It is really returning the investment that the government of Trinidad and Tobago and that you have also made in yourselves, returning that investment for the benefit of our young ones and our not so young ones. So I invite you to make yourselves available as well. If I can bring it here today, before you leave, I will try my best to get at least one of the jobs and career coaches on this facility. And I'm telling you, and I'm promising you, you would have never seen anything like that. I'm going to make the call now. Let me, therefore, as I conclude, as I said before, wish you all the best. Thank you for the invitation. And formally declare your workshop open. Thank you very much. Minister, I wish to thank you for an insightful presentation, um, certainly for bringing this holistic approach to us once again and for tapping into the human side of student services. I think it's critical that we understand that we are all humans at the end of the day. And although we identify our students with a number, behind that number is an individual living and breathing whose part was chosen to be part of our higher education institutions. So thank you again, Minister, and thank you for your continued support. At this time, I'd like to ask Ms. Alicia Ali from the Accreditation Council, also a member of the executive of the CTLP local chapter, to come to the floor. She's coming here now. And I will collaborate with her, join her to present our theme, shifting paradigms, adjusting to meet the needs of the new traditional student. So I'm going to pair up with Alicia for this particular presentation. And as we set up, 
I'll be very honest with you. So I'm taking off my chairperson cap, and I'm coming to you now as a co-presenter for this particular topic. I don't like podiums. I absolutely hate it. So I feel more comfortable. This is my comfort zone right here. OK? So this is my comfort zone. Um, as Alicia gets the presentation together, I want to throw out a question to you. I want to ask how many of you have heard the term new traditional student by a show of hands? Some people, you could put your hand up. OK, we have one Marcia from the University of the West Indies International Office. So you have heard of the term new traditional student. Anyone on the side? New traditional student. Well, we're going to have a real captive audience this, after, this morning. Marcia, could you share with us your idea or, or your interpretation of that concept? I don't know if there's a mic floating around. OK, uh, Philip will bring the mic over to you. But it is something that we really want you to think about. To some of you, it may seem new. To some of you, as we go through the presentation, you would recognize that there are elements of it that you, are you would be familiar with. So as we wait for the mic to come on this side, Now, the linguists would be at us for this, eh? new traditional. That's an oxymoron in and of itself. Thanks, Marcia. OK, um, when they say that it's a new traditional student, traditionally, students were between the ages of um, just coming out of secondary school. So they would have been like about maybe 18 to 20. 223 but your new traditional student now is students who actually range into the mature level and that type of stuff so when you say new traditional you just mean a little spin that the um, age range is just a little bit bigger and wider and we have to start not just catering for people who just leave university but we have to also cater for the mature student thank you Marcia and you are you have a lot of the elements of it combined. And what we're going to do today is to provoke the thought. We're going to go a little bit into this new dimension, what we're calling a paradigm shift, where we're seeing a change in our demographic, our student demographic. And it is a change that we need to cater to. Students now, they don't want to hear about their lives fitting into institutional um, arrangements or, or in, in, institutional imperatives. They want study to fit into their lives. And if we don't recognize that, we'll be caught in a little monkey pants. So I'm going to toss over to Alicia, who will do the first part of the presentation, and I will take over from there. Please feel free to take notes. At the end, we wanted to, do, to just reflect a bit, so it may be useful to just jot down some notes. OK? Alicia? Good morning, everyone. Yeah. First, we're going to go through some of the objectives of this presentation this morning. The first objective would be to highlight the difference between traditional and non-traditional students. Secondly, we want to illustrate that non-traditional student enrollment now constitutes a large and growing percentage of those enrolled in higher education, and they are fast becoming the new traditional student, as Christy alluded to earlier. Um, and this represents what we term a paradigm shift in higher education. Thirdly, we want to understand exactly what is contributing to this paradigm shift. Then we're going to highlight some of the challenges these new traditional students face and how it affects their success. We're also going to emphasize the role of tertiary level personnel. And when we say tertiary level personnel, it's both academic and administrative staff um, in maximizing the success of all students. And then we want to recognize that this paradigm shift and the importance that it has on the retention of the new traditional student. So um, how do we conceptualize what exactly constitutes a student? We can look at it in two different ways, the traditional students and non-traditional students. 
So exactly how do we define exactly what is a traditional student and what is a non-traditional student? So we can define them based on their characteristics. So here we see a traditional student and the characteristics. Um, whoops. Okay. So it's basically a student who is between 18 to 22 years old as the um, person who um, Marcia um, suggested. They enter high education right after secondary school. They're full time. They have limited family obligations and they have limited financial obligations. And then we look at non-traditional students. They have a delayed enrollment, so they are usually a lot more mature than um, between 18 to 22. They are part-time for at least part of the academic year. They work full-time while enrolled, financially independent. They have dependents other than a spouse, usually children or elderly parents to take care of. They themselves are parents, um, and some of them can be single parents, you know, some may be separated or divorced. Um, what we're seeing in our high education system is that a higher, um, a large and growing percentage um, of the students possess characteristics of traditional students. Now, these non-traditional, when you look at the characteristics of the non-traditional students, the new traditional student may not necessarily possess all of the characteristics, but they possess some. So an example, some examples would be an 18-year-old who has just finished secondary school. They want to study, but they also want to work. So they may enroll in full-time, in a full-time job, but yet they may be studying part-time. Um, another example could be a 43-year-old mother who um, is married and has kids. Um, she's been out of the education system for about 20, over 20 years, but she decides to return to school full time and her um, spouse will support her. So these are some of the dynamics that we have to deal with. So now we're going to do it, what, we're, what I'm going to do is examine some of the statistics at an international level looking at the US, at a local level looking at local statistics in Trinidad and Tobago and at an institutional level focusing specifically on two indicators of a non-traditional student, which would be their enrollment status um, as well as their age. So we have some snapshots of statistics. So according to the National Center for Education Statistics in 2011, um, they had an enrollment of almost 21 million students. And in terms of the enrollment status, 61.9% are full-time, whereas 38.1% are part-time. So you see a large percentage, almost 40%, are part-time students representing a characteristic of a non-traditional student. Then we look at enrollment age. 60% less than 25, and 39.2% 25 years and over. So here again, we see almost 40% of the students um, possess characteristics of a non-traditional student being over the age of 25. When we look at Trinidad and Tobago, um, some statistics that we have is um, this is presented by, this is from the Statistical Digest on Post-Secondary and Tertiary Education, um, published by MSTTE, now MTES, in 2010. Um, at the time, it had 80 registered institutions. The response rate was a bit low. Only 57.6% of the institutions responded. And the enrollment that they, um, they indicated were about 52,620 uh, 52, students. So when you look at the enrollment status, you see about 50%, 50.7% um, were full-time and 49.3% um, part-time. The, um, the diagram may be a little off, probably because it was stretched, but this should be almost even. So here we see a large percentage of the students actually being part-time and having attributes of a non-traditional student. Then we look at the enrollment age. 62.2% um, less than 25, and 25 and over we have 38.8%. Here again, we have a large proportion of the students who possess characteristics of a non-traditional student. So now we're going to look at um, UE St. Augustine. And this is an institutional example of enrollment data. 
And here again, we see the same pattern internationally in Trinidad and Tobago and at the, a particular institution. This data comes from the UE St. Augustine student statistics that's published on their website um, for 2011 to 2012. Um, the enrollment is 18,775 students. And uh, we see the same kind of data again. Full-time students, 63.9%. Part-time evening, and this includes evening students as well, 36.1%. Enrollment age, we have those who are less than 25 years old, 52.9%, and 25 and over, 38.2%. So now I'm going to show you some, oops, all right, so what we have here is, I talked about the proportion of students, now I'm going to talk about growth rates. So I have here a, um, a graph representing the enrollment of students in the U.S. from 1970 to um, 2020. And for the last two points, it represents 2015 and 2020, and those are projections that the National um, Center for Education Statistics in the U.S. published. And here again, we're looking at two indicators, status and age. So first we're looking at status. And you see that um, what the graph illustrates is that much of the growth for 2000 to 2010 um, is for full-time students, and the number of full-time students has increased by 45%. But when we look at age, we see a more revealing picture. Um, the percentage increase of students over 25 is larger than the percentage increase for younger students, and this pattern is expected to continue. And the National Center for Education Statistics, they project that from 2010 to 2020, there will be an 11% increase in the students under 25, and an even larger percentage, a 20% increase in students 25 years and over. Um, so now I'm going to go through some of the factors that contribute to the rise in the new traditional students. So we have a number of factors here. Um, traditionally, or we see students who enroll in tertiary education um, being funded by their family, their parents, and so on. They were limited institutions available for, um, for students to pursue tertiary education. But now higher education is not only available, but it's also accessible to a lot of students. So this results in a greater trust to lifelong learning. So now you don't have just 18 year olds finishing secondary school entering the education system, but you see a lot of more mature students returning for purposes of self-fulfillment, self-enrichment. Others return to school to enhance their opportunities in the labor market as there's an increasing demand by employers for credentials. And all of this inevitably contributes to the knowledge society and sustainable development, as well as the national development imperative, which is really sustainable development and the creation of a knowledge society. So what we really want to look at is not, is focusing, we do focus on access now, but we'd also like to consider success. All right, I'll pass you on to my friend, Christy, who will take over the rest of the slides. Thank you, Alicia. Um, and I'm, ha I'm, I'm sure you're happy to see that some of the statistics were presented, which could give you a different view and a different perception of what is actually taking place in our higher ed institutions. As Alicia mentioned, while we focus on access, which is readily accessible, the minister alluded to GATE, and he did inform us that the GATE program will continue, which means that there would be more opportunities for other persons, other potential and prospective students wishing to pursue lifelong learning. Um, while that is available, we must also focus on the transition, the next step. So after you enter, when you get in, what happens then? And so the whole notion of success um, comes back to a sort of conceptual shift. We have to shift our mind, a conceptual shift away from the traditional narrative of life being linear, 
And I say linear, okay, so we study, we work, and then we retire. That was the traditional notion of education and life. And so now what we're finding is that the very persons who have studied initially or who are working are now returning to plan for retirement. It is part of their retirement plan. It's, it, is a re, it is a reversal, it is it's a move away from what traditionally existed. And we as student services personnel, as tertiary level um, personnel, need to embrace and encompass that in our strategic plans, in our departmental objectives and goals. And so I want to speak to the whole notion of success. And we have here, if you look up on the slides, it says the interpretation of success. Yes, do you agree that there are different interpretations of success? Do you agree? Good. So in the interpretations of success, we have the, 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 the fact, we have to first start with the fact that success is a very uh, complex concept. It really depends on the conceptual lenses you choose to wear and the level you sit. So at the student level, they have one interpretation of success. The institution may have another, and we can go even further to talk about the institution, the units, the departments, the centers. They each may have a different interpretation of success, and we'll come to that later on. And then they, at the higher national level, they would have what they put forward as a successful student. And in thinking about it, we also have to address a number of factors that impact upon success. So for example, in looking at the student's interpretation, there are, there are critical areas that we must include. And Baudier talks about habitus, looking at uh, social circumstances, economic social um, circumstances, gender, ethnicity, and different attributes that impact on the student's interpretation of success. So while we may put programs together, and while we may put services together, are those services and programs, though accessible, uh, though available, are they accessible and are they meeting the needs of the new traditional student? The new traditional student is coming with a wealth of information, some of them who are over the age, who are already in the working environment. They are coming with a different skill set. How do we utilize, how do we maximize that skill set? And that's why I was happy that Alicia brought up the point about both academic and administrative members of staff having an impact on student success, having an impact on the new traditional student, because we tend to think that uh, it's just the administrators. But we have all the tears and it must filter right through the system. Therefore, we need to look at, if we look at the, the institution's role, the institution may look at success from the, from the view of retention, as I'm sure Mr. Moody would speak to today. Retention and completion of degrees, perhaps. Maybe the overall experience. I know at the University of the West Indies, that has now been incorporated. And more and more you will see signs that the experience plays a major part in the retention rates, and I think universities are now embracing that. Furthermore, at the governmental level, at the national level, we have um, indicators such as how successful the, the socioeconomic indicators, um, the percentage of persons returning to the workplace who are skilled, who can contribute to, to research and development, who are innovative. These things indicate to us um, the, 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 uh, the work that the higher education institutions are doing or are not doing, because it also starts there. We cannot continue to put the blame solely on the students. Therefore, we need to take a more holistic view of success, a more holistic perspective, and Minister alluded to that today. He spoke all the different items. I couldn't write down all. I, I hope that I can get a copy of the recording. But certainly, all that the Minister spoke about today is in keeping with a holistic view. And that's when we say a paradigm shift. That's what we're really referring to. Changing your whole perception of how we treat with students, of how we deal with students. And that impacts on their success. So I want to ask you, 
to what extent, because I'm sure some of you would have interacted with your students, yes? Yes or no? Yes. So you have a general idea of um, some of their perceptions when it comes to the institution and success. How many of you have in, actually incorporated some of their perceptions into your own um, objectives, into the way you deal with students? But maybe by a show of hands. This is scary. Student services personnel. Okay, I'm seeing one, two, three. Okay, so then, thank you. Thank you for, for raising your hands. So then it speaks to a greater need for us to move beyond. We need to move beyond to see the student not just as a passive bystander, but we need to take the student's um, perceptions. We need to take their recommendations. We need to understand how they feel about things and incorporate it into our departments, into our missions, into our strategic plans. They must be an integral part of the feedback process, feeding back into information that would help you to realign your systems. And so these new traditional students, I just want to add to what um, Alicia mentioned earlier. The new traditional student has a bias to the non-traditional characteristics. And so you would find that there's a constant battle to balance work, life, study. I'm sure there are members of faculty here who have, who have lectured classes. I don't like to say lectures, they teach. Who have taught classes where the, they're bringing in their children into the classrooms. I can identify with that, but what can you do? It speaks to a greater problem. It speaks to the fact that higher ed institutions need to put certain facilities in place because the new traditional student certainly isn't the 18 year old anymore who's coming home from mommy and daddy with their food packed out on Sundays. The new traditional student represents an individual who is coming back. They're coming in, they get their degree, they, they focus, they try to do what they need to do and get out because they have to go home and take care of the kids. So we need to recognize this, the balancing of this. So if we examine the workplace, the workplace, because as much as we are student services personnel, we, in some capacity, we are also supervisors, managers. What type of systems do you have in your department that caters to the needs of this new traditional student that would afford them things like flexi time to go to classes? Classes starting 5 o'clock, they're working in San Fernando, although there's now the South Initiative in UE, and they have to come up here. They ask to come to work 7 to 3, and you tell them no. How are you impacting on that? How are you impacting on that change that we're trying to foster? In your own departments, in your higher ed institutions, when your staff tells you, listen, I have to go to a class, or if you, the person brings the timetable schedule at the beginning of the semester, and you say, this is what I need to do. Do you cater to those needs? What type of arrangements do you put in place to ensure that this employee has a class to go to which would enhance the skill of the employee, which would rebound to the institution and again at the national level? So it's a broader thinking, it's a more holistic approach. Family life. I sit at the University of the West Indies, I sit as the evening university coordinator. And I often tell people, I am not the evening university coordinator, I am not an administrator, I am a counselor. I have never done a course in counseling. But many of the students coming in, they are coming in with a lot of issues that impact on their final grades and their whole, um, their whole uh, experience at the university. There was one particular student, she came in for academic advising. And we started off good. She, she was just about 43, thereabouts. And then the, she broke down. Why? The phone kept ringing constantly while I was advising her. And it, she just broke down. Her husband was calling. If she didn't get home by 8 o'clock, blows. And I, of course, I eventually found us out 
through interrogation and so on. But these are things that we need to consider. This is the new student. There are social factors that have to be filtered in to our administrative processes. And of course, commuting, and I think I sort of mentioned it in talking about leaving work and having to come up. What kinds of systems have your higher education institutions put in place to perhaps accommodate students traveling long distances? How active is your guild of students? Do you work closely with the guild of students? If you cannot as a department or as an institution or as a, as a unit, facilitate these processes, maybe you can look for other avenues to assist. And of course, there is social life. If there are any evening or mature students inside of here, they will say there is none. There is no social life. Because you're rushing from work to come home, you're leaving to come back, you the children, etc. So these are some of the factors we need to consider. I just want to talk briefly about, but about the, what I am calling the wilderness experience, sort of disillusionment. And I heard it again, the panel spoke about it, members of the panel. You come into university as a first year student, you have no idea, you're returning to school, your coping skills are shot, your study skills are shot, you're it's a whole new world. You're seeing all these teenagers walking around. Sometimes they're in your class. They're answering all the questions. You feel like you don't know anything. These things impact on you. And that ha also has an impact on the um, retention rate as well as the rate of dropouts after the first year. So first year orientation processes become critical to this new group of students. We need to put things in place, workshops that deal with time management, stress management, writing skills. Some of them have been out of school for a while and we need to embellish. So we have to think about these things. And again, I, I mentioned it just now, um, in an, the inability to cope with these challenges can have an impact on some of these areas here. One, the time to degree completion. How quick, how quickly they get out of the system. Excuse me. And not only how quickly, but sometimes they stay in the system too, so long as a result of failing certain courses over and over, which speaks to curriculum issues as well, um, that the time has elapsed for gate coverage. So then they find themselves in a position where they now have to take out 12, 13, 1400 dollars per course. And you're doing maybe three, four courses a semester. And so that puts an additional burden on the student. So they now have to contend with financial considerations, financial um, obligations. And then we look at the class of degree. Now, Class of degree is, is a little controversial because they are just some students who are excellent exam takers. But we must be cognizant of the fact that if we are getting students graduating with a lot of pass degrees, just minimum pass, it speaks to something. Something is going on there that we need to examine. We need to probably look at the pedagogy, the course design curriculum. But for this group of students, we need to look at the other social factors that may be pressing on them and contributing to just D and C grades just so that they can get out of the system and say they have a degree. And by the way, when they graduate and they say they have a degree, they're not saying they have a past degree. Eh? They say, I have a degree from X university, from X institution, so your institution then becomes the representative, the, 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 um, is represented through and in that degree. And of course, as reputable rep institutions, we want to ensure that we are putting out the best and the brightest. <clears throat> and, um, well, the RTW, sorry, sorry, Alicia. The RTW required to withdraw, again, that, that is in line with the kind of degree. We have a number of students after first year receiving what is called an RTW, well, at, at the university in which I work. And, and that is a little alarming because we should not wait until it gets to that point. And I think this is where the paradigm shift comes in. We should be actively looking at student records 
to see how they're progressing through the system, as opposed to waiting until they get the RTW, the GPA goes below 0 1.00, um, and then they have no gate, they have no degree, they have to come out of the system and return later on, perhaps having to pay for the first year of, for their re-entry. So the RTWs, that's something we need to consider. And um, what I could probably advise you to do is start a project in your own office where those of you who have access, or maybe you can suggest it to your superiors, to start a project where you actively look at students. It's going to be a lot, but you can do it over time. Look at the rate of progress of your students. Treat each student as a human and not a number. Therefore, you'd have a vested interest in their academic performance. And I'm talking to the administrators too. I'm not just talking to the academics. So therefore, what can we as tertiary level personnel do to meet the needs of the new traditional student? And while um, Mr. Mantrun was speaking, one word came to my mind, flexibility. In this globalized world that we live in, where there's technology at our fingertips, we live in this world, everybody's right here. We're going to be a society with carpal tunnel syndrome soon if we don't stop. But we need to become flexible. We need to open up and expand not only the opportunities, not only the, the availability, not only the accessibility, but expand our approach to students in order to maximize their success. And so we looked at the academic and the administrative staff at the tertiary level. And these are some of the areas in which you would find academic and administrative staff. And I know some of you fall somewhere along this line. Counseling exams, academic advising, health services, etc., and admissions. And I just want to point out one thing while Minister was speaking. It drew my attention to a student who I considered a square peg in a wrong hole. You know that term, right? square pegs in wrong holes. And the minister was saying, why are, when, when a student gets his fourth option, what does that say? How does that motivate that student to push forward? At the end of the day, when that student graduates with that degree, how are they going to translate that degree, which they didn't want to do in the first place, hence it was fourth place, into some sort of national development imperative? How are they going to enhance your particular institution? And so university, the university from the top straight down, need to consider that. And I have an example of a student who pursued a course at the university. And one of the lecturers called me over and she said, look at this examination paper. So I started to read it. The student went on to give a whole story about him not wanting to do this program. He doesn't know why the university put him to do this. This is an exam. Huh? Such was his frustration that he opted to write a letter instead of doing the exam. And it, it was funny because he started to talk about the girl in front of him and her hair is so beautiful and you know, it have, it don't have many good looking people in here. And it was funny, but it, it, again, it spoke to something deeper, a square peg in a round hole. So our admissions process, admission staff, needs to examine the, the, the real reason why these persons are coming back. They need to fit them into, not, a, not a, a square peg in a wrong hole, but they need to fit them into a situation where they feel comfortable, where they feel passionate. Because if you don't have the passion from now, when you get to graduate school, that's it. That's it. You would not be motivated to go on. And so we need to consider that. And so I'm asking then, Deans, heads, senior administrative staff, lecturers, instructors, you too play a critical role in student services. In a study done at an Australian university recently, probably two years ago, they indicated that students reported that if, let me read it here, non-traditional students reported, let's see if I could find the stat. If the teacher is more approachable, well-prepared, sensitive to students' needs, the student's success 
may be, then student success may be experienced. Lecturers, teachers, you have a role to play as well. You have to shift as well, that paradigm shift, away from the traditional behavioralist approach to a more student-led, constructivist approach to teaching. Let the student lead. Yes, you, we know you know everything, you have your degrees, but share the information, let the student be part of the teaching and learning process. That is also critical to the overall experience of the student and to retention rates and to catering to the needs of the new student because they're coming in with ideas. Yes, they are, they're coming in with ideas that we need to um, incorporate. So how do we move forward? Okay. Well, together first, moving forward together, institutions must have a vision and a mission. It is part of the criteria of the um, Accreditation Council, firstly. They must have objectives and strategic plans which must filter down to all levels within the institution. Maybe it should filter up. I don't know. Higher education institutions should be geared towards the needs and objectives of the students. How many of you here today know what your institution's mission, vision, or strategic plan is by a show of hands? Okay, so we have about 20 persons, 25 persons, and I know we printed about 200 flyers. So that is just a small percentage. So we need to embrace it because we would all be working at different levels. We'd all be working towards different goals. So we need to streamline and align our goals to meet the institution's strategic objectives. We need to partake in discussions and the online surveys that they said asking us how we feel about things that we just ignore when we see it, you know, we put it in the junk mail. We need to do that because that is how you can contribute to the improvement of your services. I said before that students expect study to fit into their lives and not they do, not want, um, they do not want to fit their lives into institutional expectations. And how do we accommodate that? We need to be proactive. We need to shift our changing. We need to respond to the challenges and find creative ways of dealing with it. We need to also help students integrate into academ the academic culture. Help them to adapt to the, the institutional changes and the new traditions and, and embrace what had gone before. We need to find ways to enable students to succeed, and we need to develop a relationship between the student and the institution. I'm going to UE, but all I'm doing is I'm going and coming back home. I, I just want my degree. That, that's good, but we need them to feel like they're a part as well. We need to inculcate them into the institution. And so these are some of the, the areas um, that you can look at for maximizing success. C uh, provide consistent life coaching, t look at time management, financial management, mentoring students, be accessible. Are your office hours from 8.30 to 4.30 still? We have students coming after five. So we need to make sure that our office, even simple things like the office hours, our modes of communication are aligned. Send emails, they have text messages, Facebook, all different mediums um, that you could utilize to reach your students. And so the impact of this paradigm shift on retention is at all three levels. The regional level, it contributes to um, successful learning and a new traditional student would contribute to regional development as we are small island developing states look, uh, look to pool together our resources so that we can move forward. Uh, societal, uh, we have a problem with migration, brain drain, where the best and the brightest are leaving and you know we're left here with, with, with well, great ones, but we want to also keep our best and brightest. So what are we doing to retain and attract as well new students and existing students and current students? And of course, um, at the institutional level, these things we would look at more students at the research level. More students at research level may possibly be mean more grants and funding for the institution to, do, to engage in research activities, particularly in these hard economic times and of course feedback on, from students on curriculum review. Now I'm way over time, but I felt that this was 
extremely important. Um, I am an advocate for mature students, so it was there to me. So I just want to thank you for your attention, and uh, maybe we have time for one or two questions, and then we'll go to the breakfast. No questions? Good. I think you all, somebody told you all I was taking too long, so don't ask any questions. Okay, so I want to thank you again, and we're just going to invite you at this time to have a refreshment just for a brief moment. We have to cut the time short. We're running a bit late today. So perhaps just about 10 minutes. It's now 5 after 1, so at quarter after 1. Sorry, after 11. Oh, I'm sorry, after 11. I'm, I'm rushing the day. So at just about uh, quarter after 11, we will return. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we would now like to resume with our program and take you straight into our feature presenter who's going to speak to you more on student retention towards improving graduation rates. Could you please give a warm welcome to Mr. Chris Moody, membership coordinator of the ACPA. Hello. Thank you for, for inviting me to visit with you in Trinidad. This is my first uh, visit to Trinidad, but uh, definitely and hopefully not my last. So uh, I've enjoyed my time here very much. Uh, your hus hospitality has been warm and uh, uh, remarkable. I particularly want to thank uh, the CTLPA executive um, board and officers for their kind and, and generous welcome and hospitality uh, since I've been here. Uh, yesterday, I had really great visits uh, with staff uh, working uh, towards student success at the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine, and the, here at the University of Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, this is about sharing ideas. This is a mutual exchange of ideas. And so I want to thank all of you that met with me yesterday uh, to talk about our, our shared goal of supporting students uh, in, their, uh, in their success at their time at the university. I'm, I'm here on behalf of the governing board for the American College Personnel Association, College Student Educators International. For short, we just call ourselves ACPA, uh, but we do have an international mission. Uh, I particularly bring you greetings from ACPA's executive director, Greg Roberts, as well as our current president, Keith Humphrey, uh, both of whom were not able to travel uh, this time, but they, they said to tell you hello, and they hope to see you all very soon. Uh, I also wanted to share well, uh, greetings from uh, individuals and my colleagues on the board who have visited previously. Uh, many of you have met uh, Dr. Susan Salvador, Dr. Heidi Levine, and Dr. Kathleen Kerr. They all also say hello. Uh, my experience with ACPA uh, is as the Director of Membership Development, and so you see on the slides the things that I'm responsible for in that role. Uh, new member recruitment, our current member retention and satisfaction, I uh, supervise our awards program and recognition program. I'm responsible for how our members are involved and get involved and stay involved and, and continue to enjoy their experience in our professional association. As mentioned previously, I co-chair uh, with Ms. Merritt Henry, the International Member Advisory Board, and I'm responsible for the association's uh, efforts outside of the United States. This, this broad portfolio of responsibilities certainly gives me the opportunity to interact with thousands, or nearly 8,000 members of the association. But it also gives me a chance one-on-one -on -one to talk, as I did yesterday with the staffs of the two campuses I visited. ACPA very much values our relationship uh, with the Caribbean Tertiary Level Personnel Association. And so my final thank you is to the Caribbean Tertiary Level Personnel Association, its officers, current and past, for your service to student success and to the student affairs and services profession. Professionals from the Caribbean have been actively involved in the association's work for many, many years, and I hope in the audience today are the professionals that are going to inspire that work in, for many years to come. But ACPA is not the job that pays my bills. That, I do that for free. Uh, I do that for because I love students. I love student success. I love making sure that students are successful on our campuses. The job that pays me is at American University, uh, where I'm Assistant Vice President for Campus Life. My portfolio, the things I'm responsible for on the, our campus, are the Campus Housing Program, the Residential Education Program, 
on campus as well as off campus dining in our local community, our summer programs and conferences that happen on our campus when students are not at high numbers, as well as the univer university ident identification uh, and access card program. I also serve on various committees at the university, many of which touch on the importance of student success. The emergency response team, violence prevention team, the enrollment, new student enrollment and marketing team, as well as the first year success. And it's through those experiences that I really have, have developed an appreciation for the importance of, of the topic of retention uh, and, and is the backdrop for, for many of my remarks today. I do think it's important that you know the, the institution that I work at, so that uh, hopefully it'll inspire you to come visit my campus one day uh, as well. You are welcome, and I'd love to be able to host any of you that are interested in coming and visiting American University. I'm located in Washington, D.C., in the, in the United States nation's capital. Uh, we are a private uh, institution uh, with our undergraduate student population is just over uh, 6,200. Our graduate and master's population is equal to our undergraduate. So in total, we are about uh, 12,000, between 12,000 and 13,000 students that our campus serves. We are famous. Uh, for political activism. So if you ever see uh, photos in the news media of protests on campuses or students laying down in front of cars to prevent people from moving down driveways, that's probably my campus. Um, we have a number of study abroad programs, over 100 sites uh, each year that our students visit. Um, most impressively to me is, is our uh, average class size of 23 students, very much valuing the one-on-one -on -one personal attention. Uh, we have 646 faculty members, 95% of which are full-time uh, teaching professionals. Our student to faculty ratio is 13 to 1. Uh, the various faculties that our students are, are engaged in, you see the, the primary majors are arts and sciences, business, communication, international service, law, professional studies, as well as public affairs. The next slide talks about our retention rates because I think it's not only important that you, uh, that you know that I'm coming from a place, an institution, where retention is critical and is being done well. Um, you see there are some numbers and, and slides that show the increase of our first year student retention rates just in a three year span increasing by 4% as a result of some of the strategies that I'm going to introduce to you today as, as potential things for you to think about. But what's more impressive than the first year student retention rate is the, the dramatic increase in second year retention rate. So when you do work that increases your first year to second year retention, our second year to third year retention rate has doubled. What was a 4% increase for first year retention then became an 8% increase for second year retention. So there's a critical relationship there between if you can increase your first year second success rate, your second year success rate would also go up. The other thing to keep in mind though, when you get better at retention, there's a greater draw on your campus resources. So there's more students uh, using the library. There are then more students using your dining facilities. There are more students using your recreation facilities. More students signing up for classes. So retention comes at really great benefits, but there are also campus services that are important to also make sure are adequately staffed for dramatic improvements in student success and retention. Just a little bit more about, about the students I work with. Um, they come from 139 countries. All 50 US states are represented. Um, just under uh, 1,700 students major in international studies. It's our largest uh, population and the largest international degree program uh, for students. So my campus, while located in the United States, has an international emphasis and an international flavor and focus. 81% of our students uh, are in, do an internship and work, uh, usually not for pay, uh, at an internship site before they graduate, and 59% of our students study abroad. 71% of our students report that keeping up to date on political activities is important to them, and 79% report that improving their understanding of other countries and cultures is important to their experience. To the topic of student retention now, uh, I, I use the imagery of a, the, of a spotlight. We we're shining a spotlight on student success. But I, it's not just one spotlight, it's 
One spotlight doesn't do the trick. You need multiple spotlights to show uh, the lighting on a stage or the lighting of a full scene. And so that's exactly what student retention is like. It's not just one thing that you can do that's magically going to transform your student's experience, but it's going to take multiple spotlights, multiple things, and a combination and a clustering that's going to then lead to an improved and enhanced campus experience. Before we begin, I, I have the, the cute graphic there of everyone getting on the same page. So that's what I want to do first, is all of us get on the same page with definitions to make sure that uh, we're all using similar language regarding the, the concepts of retention, attrition, completion, and persistence. Retention, you see the definition there is the rate at which entering students enroll in the following term or year. So you're looking at new students coming in and the, the percent to which or the extent to which they enroll in the, the following term or year. Attrition is the opposite of retention. Attrition is the rate at which entering students do not enroll. So attrition is what we're trying to fight against. Retention is what we're trying to, to work towards. Completion is typically defined as the rate at which entering students complete their degrees within about 150% of the expected or normal program length. Um, in the U.S., uh, most institutions are four-year programs, so we watch a six-year completion rate. That's what we measure. Um, many different countries use that in different ways, but typically it's 150% of the, the ter normal term that it would take to complete a degree. Defines what your completion rate is. The word that I like better than retention or completion, because those are, those are numbers, those are counts, those are dollar signs and dollar bills. The term I like is persistence, because persistence is what we as student affairs professionals and student services professionals, this is what we affect. We have the ability to affect persistence. And persistence is the desire and action of a student to stay within the system of higher education from beginning through completion. Note the key words there. It's the desire and the actions of a student. That's what we affect. So if, if you feel like you're not able to, to affect student retention or student completion, that what can one person do? I want to change that framework and have you think about your relationship to persistence and your, your role in, in changing the desires and the actions that students engage in that then help them move towards coming back the following year and being retained and then moving towards the completion of their degree. Uh, retention, we, we've had great emphasis on this, this topic this morning, and I think all of your, the previous panelists have spoken eloquently to the importance of student retention. The few things that I will highlight is the greatest risk to retention, or the greatest threat to, uh, to uh, retention, is students not completing their first year. If you can help a student finish through the first year, you will see dramatic changes to the completion rate. So the greatest risk to retention is students not coming back from the second term or second year of their studies. The U.S. national rate of retention from first to second years of studies is 77.1 percent of students who begin return to the second year. Uh, you see from the slides previously, if you remember when I share, shared my institution's uh, numbers, that we uh, hover between 90 and 92 percent first to second year retention rate. So we, we are really excited and believe that we're doing this well. And I, once we get into the specific strategies, I hope to offer you some, some tips or things that have worked well for me and my institution and many institutions in the United States that might be able to, to be customized or tweaked to work as well here. I do want to highlight, uh, and I think it's, it's, it's easy to get caught into the belief that the, the goal of retention should be 100%. In my opinion, the goal of retention should not be 100%. The goal of persistence should be 100%. But the goal of retention it should not be 100% as your, your university's target. The reason I say that is the institution is not going to be a good fit for every student. 
um, and the, the student's not going to be a good fit for the institution. So as a, as, a, or as, a, as a university, your administration needs to decide, you know, what, what does it mean to be, have a good fit with my institution? What does it mean to be a UE student? Um, a lot of that comes from the mission and goals and objectives uh, that the prior panelists uh, shared with you as well. Uh, Syracuse University is known, uh, it's in New York, is known in, in the United States as being one of the institutions that does student retention the very best. Uh, they uh, annually have a first to second year retention rate between 94 to 95 percent of first year students they're able to retain. Well, I started thinking about it and I said, well, I wonder, I wonder why. What, what are they doing so well that, that's magical? Uh, and I found this, the site that's listed there, syracuse.edu slash current students. If you go to that site, I understood why they're doing so well, just from their web page. The text on their website, here are the headers that students can, can select, uh, some of them. Stop bias, crisis help, international students, Office of Student Assistance, support at Syracuse University, living in and being engaged at Syracuse University, and what to do at Syracuse University. All of those things are attracting students who were looking for fit, who were looking for, for help and resources. They're, this is hitting on that persistence term that we talked about previously. They're, they're exactly matching the things that lead to the desire and actions that students uh, should participate in to, to be able to move towards completion of their degrees. So I wanted to offer that website as a resource to you as you're thinking and learning about how you can um, build a retention program that is student-centered. Shifting to completion, again, we've defined completion as finishing the degree within 150% of the normal completion time. Um, the most recent U.S. data on student completion uh, shares that there's a 55.5% national six-year completion rate. So of the students who enter as first-year students, uh, six years later, 55% of those are, are moving towards graduation. Uh, there are many factors that play into uh, a student's completion rate. Um, the two largest predictors of students' completion, we've already shared one of them, is retention from first year to second year is the largest predictor. The second one, and this ties into the presentation um, just before we took the breakfast break, the second largest threat to completion is part-time versus full-time student status. A full-time student is much more likely to complete within the normal completion rate than a part-time student is. Um, there are many things that, that your previous presenter shared with you about family responsibilities, work responsibilities, et cetera, that come in the way uh, of, of students being able to complete the degree, and the longer the degree time takes, the more difficult it is to reach that end goal because challenge, more and more challenges can come into, into play. And then finally, persistence. Uh, for the purposes of this conversation, uh, the words at risk, students get thrown around quite a bit. Uh, and uh, for the purpose of this conversation, I'm using the words at risk to mean students who are at risk to not return to the university for the following year uh, as, as the definition. Uh, because if they don't come back the next year, we don't need to worry about their graduation rate. We've got to, we want to get them back in the following year. Um, there are many factors that could label someone as at risk, um, and, and hopefully this presentation will highlight what some of those factors are. Again, back to the spotlight concept. Um, again, it takes multiple perspectives and initiatives and strategies to move towards uh, a model um, of student success at your university. Today's event organizers asked, have asked me to share with you a brief overview of what some of those issues are. Uh, you see the, the main categories highlighted on the, the slide currently. But then to also share with you some strategies um, that professionals um, in student affairs and services have implored to, to help student success uh, retention towards graduation rates. I want you to think about this next section of the presentation almost like a menu when you go to a restaurant. 
When you go to a restaurant, there are lots of choices for you to choose from. Today you could feel like uh, curry, tomorrow chicken. You can change your, your, your desire based on um, whatever your circumstances, your context is at that moment. So I fully recognize that not all of these are going to be to your taste, just like many items on a menu. But I give you these to start having conversations and to think about what might uh, your campus might be able to do or what you can do in your own work to really get at the, the student success from the, the pers uh, re persistence perspective. That's a tongue twister. So the four areas I want to I cover with you are access and financial means, academic preparation and performance, health, wellness, and students in distress, and, well, and then finally campus and community engagement. So let's start with the, the topic, the factor. Um, I'll also call these threats or risks to student success. Uh, previously, uh, many of you have, have watched the, the global economic crisis uh, for the past five years, and this has absolutely devastated the, the United States higher education system and its availability of funding uh, for students. Students are now being forced to seek private loans at very high interest rates, um, leaving college in worse financial condition than when they began. I understand that, that tuition costs are covered by the GATE program here in Trinidad and Tobago, but I want to caution you that that does not mean that there are no financial risks, that your students are still experiencing financial hardships and difficulties, and so it's not, um, in my perspective, advisable to, to rest on that, but to continue to have access and financial means as at the forefront of your mind. Some of the, the issues that have uh, come into play, uh, I've previously talked about the effect of the global economy. Uh, resources are much harder to come by. Campuses and universities are being asked to do more with less resources. Uh, the cost of education continues to be on the rise. Uh, it takes more money to deliver the educational experience, particularly in light of the technology advances that all of our countries are, are facing. Uh, and as Ms. Smith referenced, having the world and knowledge at your fingertips is unlike anything that any of us experienced when we were in, in, in college. Um, and then also pressures of economic class are still at play. Students feel the pressure to keep up with their friends. If friends and colleagues are going to dinner at a restaurant nearby on a Friday or, or Saturday evening, there's the pressure to keep up. Those are not things that are, that are covered by their, their tuition costs coming to, the, to university. Um, that means there's an impact on their ability to participate fully in the campus experience or environment. How many program services workshops come possibly with the fee to participate that students might not be able to, to participate and get the full college and university experience if they have to pay to play? And then finally, many students more so than ever, uh, and the previous presentation also highlighted that the students are working in larger numbers, uh, the part-time status of students and the requirement that they, that they work to earn a living, to support a family. Uh, that is growing throughout the, the world. So now I want to turn to highlight a few things that seem to be working and campuses in the United States uh, that are supported by, by numerous research studies. So I want to share those with you uh, in hopes that this will start your menu of options to take back and think about as tangible ways that your university can start to affect student success. Um, we have moved, the U.S. has moved um, its emphasis from merit to need-based financial assistance. And so merit uh, awards typically go to students if you perform better in school, if you get all A's, if you have the higher GPAs, if you are a leader in clubs and organizations, then the, the university is interested in keeping you on campus. So we're going to give you more money in hopes that you, will not, that you will not leave, that you'll come back the next year. Well, the, the forces of the economy have, have uh, 
required a shift to looking uh, at that balance between students who are the most needy of financial assistance. So there's been a shift from students who have earned scholarships and funding and resources to students who have financial need for that. There have been efforts to level the playing field, and I have that in quotation marks, meaning if a student's needed to um, previously pay $5 to attend a theater performance or a cultural event on campus as a way to help support the cost of putting on the event, the universities have started to identify ways to either uh, remove the fee for students who have high financial need or to build it into the cost of attendance and give the departments more funding so that students don't have to pay to participate in those activities. We've also shifted from paid to free tutoring services for students. Um, most interesting and most recent is the shortening the length of time that it takes to complete the degree. This is particularly with, with focus on part-time students. And so in the U.S., tip, most institutions in the U.S. that are uh, bachelor's degree granting institutions are four-year programs. You're now seeing campuses develop three-year programs. They're developing combined bachelor's and master's degree programs that you can leave in four years with both a bachelor's degree and a master's degree. Um, the way that they're doing that is through a more intensive summer programs. Because for part-time students, the ability to balance and manage a, um, you know, a winter or spring term it's probably going to be the same conditions that it would take to balance a summer term. And so they've shifted how, how courses are offered and when courses are offered to not have the four-year degree time, but to make it three years or four years with a combined degree program. You, you leave the campus with two degrees rather than one. Increasing student jobs on campus. Um, I. Uh, have, have shared with several people in, in my visit that my, my department on campus, uh, we employ 250 students in my department. Uh, just my, my department. The, inst the in, um, institution overall employs nearly 1,200 students each year in, in employment opportunities. So as you have the chance to look at staffing, what can be done, what transactions or lower level services can be done by student staff to give them work experience, internship experiences, but also to help pay for their educational costs and resources. We've also done quite a bit of work to bundle those extra costs into their student tuition and fees. And so a student uh, who needs to go to a health clinic can now bill that to their student account that would be covered by scholarships and financial aid and government assistance. And so it's not just for the, the direct cost of receiving the education, but bundling experiences and some of those extra costs for students so that tuition costs can cover those. Uh, we have many campuses have emergency loans, and I know that some of your campuses also have an emergency loan fund as well um, that helps students in a crisis situation. And then we've also started offering financial literacy workshops. And so educating students on what, what is debt? What is, a, what is a credit history? What is a credit check? How do you start planning and saving money um, so that when you leave the campus, you are prepared to take on the financial responsibilities of being an adult? Let's move in the interest of time to academic preparation and performance. My students love this slide. Uh, you, if, I don't know if you can read it from where you're sitting, but it says studying. Notice how they conveniently put dying at the end of the word. Uh, there is a growing belief that secondary schools are not doing good enough work in preparing students to uh, accept the challenges, the academic challenges that it takes when coming, coming to university. There's also the debate over whether admissions test scores or entrance test scores actually predict academic success and future performance. Uh, we're finding that students learn themselves that they're failing courses too late to change anything, too late for it to matter. There are rampant 
inconsistencies in advising policies and practices and what uh, one advisor may tell us a, a student that they need to take this course to be on time to graduate uh, they may be told incorrectly with the next person that they speak with so we're finding quite a bit of inconsistencies uh, in advising and then insufficient academic and career um, advising. Um, typically, where, where the term insufficient comes from is a high volume of advisors to students ratio. Um, if, a, if an advisor has 200 students that they're responsible for advising, how, how can that stu each individual student be receiving the quality of advising and the, the time that they need with that mentor to help set them on the course for academic success? So those are some of the issues that relate to academic performance and preparation. What uh, are some of the best practices? Again, we'll, we're going back to our restaurant menu, things to think about, strategies to choose from. First, partnerships with secondary schools. Universities are going into secondary schools to do academic preparedness workshops, to do university planning uh, seminars for students interested in attending tertiary or higher education institutions. Um, it increases the exposure to uh, co college and university expectations, but also builds, builds relationships that can help students transition from secondary schools to their tertiary schools. Many campuses are reevaluating why do we even look at test scores? Why do we look at test scores to predict future academic performance? Uh, so campuses are experimenting with not looking at those in their admissions criteria. Early warning programs. Campuses are investing more and more in how can we find out earlier in the semester or in the term that students are not performing well academically and what can we do to influence their ultimate success in that course. I'm going to come back and talk about early warning programs in just a few minutes. Um, we are, uh, start, campuses are starting to require faculty members to do an early grade, to issue an exam, to issue a paper, to issue a test or a project or assignment that will be due within the first six weeks of the term so the students aren't waiting until the middle of the semester or the middle of the term or maybe even the end of the year to find out <laughs> I'm not doing too well in this class. And so faculty are now uh, in many campuses being required to have an early grading system. Many of those faculty are also reporting uh, within the first six weeks students who are not coming to class students who they've not have not visited office hours to talk with faculty and having a university outreach to those students to say you're not going to class you're not seeking out the resources what's 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 wrong what's how can we help how can we make sure that you are successful um, many residence halls and campus housing programs are moving to implementing residential curriculums, which basically is like a classroom and a residence hall experience. And so students learn or learning in the residence hall experience and, and growing and, and learning how to become a mature, independent, and relatable adult. And so developing programs in the campus residence halls to help those development of the soft skills to go along with the academic content that they're developing in their courses. Um, many campuses, when, when advising, the, the profession of advising first began, was, was done by faculty members who said, if you want to be a future geologist, the best person to advise you on how to become a geologist is a geologist. The, the faculty know their discipline. They're experts in their study. As we now know, life is more complicated for students entering college. Advising takes on so much more social, cultural, relational, um, financial perspectives that a geologist as a faculty member may not be able to advise them fully and holistically on how to um, successfully persist towards graduation. So there has been a shift away from faculty being advisors, academic or career advisors, to being mentors instead. 
Um, the rise of um, in and out of classroom learning experiences. So faculty are now um, using field experiences or field excursions or um, outings into the local community to help advance their curriculum. Also, there we've gotten better about information for parents. Parents are partners in the educational process uh, and not just phone calls when things go wrong. Parents are, are partners in the process of making sure their students are successful. So many campuses have developed offices that particularly support and work with parents as their primary mission at their institution. And then quite a bit of, um, with the rise of technology, technology has come to the rescue to help students and university administrators um, and staff understand what's going on with students. So I want to introduce you to one of those new technological advancements, and this is by no means a commercial for MapWorks. I don't work for them, I don't get any money for them, they're not related to ACPA or American University, but it's powerful. The MapWorks tool is a survey that students take um, within their first two weeks of coming to campus, or, and it's the start of the new semester. MapWorks asks them questions about how, much, how, many, how many hours do you expect to study each week? How much television do you watch each week? Um, how, how well do you expect to perform in your courses this semester or this term? It asks them those questions to get at their anticipated um, levels of success. Students then get a report back from this software, from MapWorks, that tells them, gosh, you said that you're gonna study four hours a week, but what we really want you to know is that the University of Trinidad and Tobago students actually on average say that they're gonna study 20 hours a week, and you said four, and therefore it's gonna give you a little red light that suggests your, your expectations may be out of whack. They may not, may not be what is expected of a University of Trinidad and Tobago student. Um, this also happens, it covers academic performance, it covers social performance and social relationships, it studies time management, study skills, social interactions, and helps students understand where they're performing themselves at, above, or below the other students at your institution. What's, what's fascinating about MapWorks um, is that it also facilitates student interactions with faculty and staff. So if we see a student with the red on study time, anticipated study time, that student's getting a phone call to come and meet with an administrator to talk about their expectations. And an early intervention, again, this is the first two weeks of the term. We're looking at students' expectations, not necessarily performance yet, but expectations, and puts an interaction, puts a face-to-face -face with a university staff member early in their education experience that says, we're concerned. We're concerned about your expectations of yourself. The other thing that happens with MapWorks is that it introduces students to resources. And so students get a green if they're, if they're performing well and if their expectations are, are realistic. They get a yellow um, if, if, <laughs> if they might want to be careful and, and seek out some additional resources and support. And then a red. You can be a, a, a single red or a double red. Um, double red means that you are at risk of leaving the institution because your responses were concerning. So as we go and look at retention being so critical in the first and second years, this double red light gives us as university administrators the knowledge that this person is an at-risk person, that we need to dedicate more time and resources to interventions with them to help make sure they are successful. The great thing about, about MapWorks, and there are other technology programs as well that you can, can research, is that it, any student that gets a yellow or a red for any question, they get, they're given a web link to online resources to help with that category or that topic that says, if you're experiencing difficulty with time management and balancing all of your responsibilities, click here to learn some resources that can help. They click that link and it goes to all of the programs, workshops, offices, and staff on campus who can help manage their, their, um, their performance of the yellow or red. 
So I just wanted to tell you that technology is changing the way that you can, can look and identify students that are, um, are, are likely to experience uh, some academic and, and social transition uh, performance issues. Health, wellness, and distress. Uh, this is probably the one that's most difficult to talk about uh, because it's often uh, the most tragic and dramatic for our students. Some of the causes of, of stress and distress and, and issues with health and wellness among students are competition with each other, competition for getting the best grades, competitions with getting the best job after they complete the degrees. They are unable to unplug. We are able, unable to unplug. You know, if you think about when you, when you learn to, to process and make meaning of the experiences and, and issues that you've encountered, it's, it's when you reflect. Well, with constant technology influence, with handheld Blackberries and smartphones and Twitter and Facebook and instant messaging and text messaging, students aren't able, aren't reflecting on their experiences, and so when they're not reflecting and making meaning of bad experiences, traumatic experiences, or difficult circumstances, they don't have the time to process and make meaning of those. Many more students are coming to campus with prior diagnosis of mental health uh, effects. This is the most medicated generation of college students to ever experience a university campus. Now we're not just dealing with um, attention deficit and hyperactive um, diagnoses, we're also experiencing students who are coming to campus depressed, who have been prescribed stimulants, not just depressants. So the, the, the mixture of the issues our students are coming to campus with are becoming more complicated. Families in general are also getting smaller um, across the globe. Uh, that means more pressure to satisfy meet family and parental obligations, and to carry on the expectations of your family. Um, in the United States particularly, we've definitely seen the, the mental health disorder um, challenges and, and rise in mental health cases and diagnoses, uh, but we've also seen a dramatic rise in campus violence. It disturbs me to, every, to turn on the, the television news and see another campus that's been threatened by violence, a violent individual, or violence towards, towards self or others. Um, and then there's also continues to be a rise in alcohol and drug abuse on campuses. One university that I want to particularly highlight um, is Cornell University. Uh, in summer, this past summer, 2012, Cornell University in New York installed mesh nets under seven bridges around campus in response to three student suicides and that occurred in 2010 off of those bridges. Um, a quote from a mental health professional um, stated that Cornell's bridge nets are the latest and most visible sign that the best and brightest are struggling. Um, also in Canada, uh, a counseling center director in Canada reported uh, just this last year that they've seen a 200% increase in the rise in mental health and students in distress cases. A survey out of the University of Alberta in Canada reported that 51% of students reported that things were hopeless for them. Hopeless. No hope. And that they felt overwhelm overwhelming anxiety. 7% of those students self-reported to have contemplated suicide. U.S. campuses have been trying to figure out the delicate balances between becoming a treatment center for students who need uh, more, more severe and, and intensive therapy, but also providing the support and resources, and whether literal or figuratively, the nets, the safety nets, to make sure that they can succeed towards graduation. Cornell University is just one example of the dramatic lengths that campuses are going to in response to the threat of, of, that are facing our campus with mental health, wellness, and students in distress. Some of the strategies that are proving effective thus far are the creation of care teams. And I talked about this a little bit yesterday with the UE staff that um, the care team is a combination of representatives from various university departments that come together, on my campus at least, once per week 
to talk about students that they're noticing and that they're concerned about as at-risk students. So professionals from counseling, the residence halls, um, the dean of students or the parents office, um, uh, various offices on disability and academic support offices, sending representatives. Also representatives from faculty. Because what we're noticing is that someone that's displaying uh, concerning behavior outside of the classroom is absolutely the person displaying concerning behaviors inside the classroom as well. And so the connection with academic faculty is critical and a care team provides that intersection so that if I'm the person that you know, is vandalizing and, um, and harassing fellow students that live in my hall from me, I'm probably displaying some negative effects in the classroom as well. And currently in most campuses, there's no way to connect those two dots so that effective intervention can happen from university staff members. So many campuses have found the development of care teams has helped connect what everyone is observing from concerning student behaviors and bringing the right people around the right tables to design custom and specific strategies for following up with the student to make sure that they are most successful. We're also seeing the development of violence and threat assessment teams. I have mentioned previously that I'm on my campus's violence prevention project team. And that campus team uh, basically is if something comes up, rises up through the care team, as this is a person that we are concerned about exhibiting violent or threatening behavior, the, the violence team is the one that looks at should this person be at campus or should they be removed from campus because they pose a specific threat to themselves or others. And so you're also, we're also seeing the rise in violence teams to try to help assess risks and threats to the campus community. Many offices and departments are putting resources online, recognizing that there may be some stigma to pursuing counseling or, um, or advice from a university administrator or staff member. And so rather than fighting that, universities are putting some of the materials and resources online to help students know, are you, are you depressed? Are you feeling anxiety? Here, take this quiz to help determine if you are depressed or if you are feeling anxious or if you should come and talk with the staff member. So the, the diagnosis is happening partially by the students themselves through a guided online resource. Peer-to-peer -peer outreach is also um, dramatically increasing. We're um, student wellness teams. And so take, for example, um, a student guild might have an, a part of the organization be about health and wellness of students and have a student team that goes and, and does programs and activities through campus um, that's peer-to-peer -peer so that students are more receptive than a university administrator or staff member saying, this is what we think you should do, come to this program, we'll help you. If a student says, hey, I'm, I'm developing this program, this new activity, I'd love for you to help and participate, that's going to be a much um, less of a barrier for the student to participate than if a university staff member says, I think you should come and do this. We've also seen a rise in bystander intervention trainings. Bystander interventions basically follows the, the philosophy of if you see something, say something. Um, and so educating students on campus how to appropriately confront each other for not meeting expectations or not uh, exhibiting civilized and um, you know, university expectations to other students and helping students have the skills to confront each other and to say, I, I don't like what you're doing, I don't think what you're doing is appropriate, and to be comfortable and confident doing that. And so we have seen a rise in bystander intervention programs. Campuses are also uh, recognizing that um, alcohol and the rise of alcohol is a cultural um, uh, fact that's here to, to stay. And so rather than trying to reduce or eliminate the alcohol culture, there's efforts to normalize the al alcohol culture. On my campus, we learned that on a Friday and Saturday night, two-thirds of students reported they're not having a drink at all. 
But if you hear students talk about the Friday or Saturday night experience, there's a party over here, there's a party at this person's place, everyone's drinking. In reality, it was only one third of students drinking. And so having posters that feature prominent student leaders or university administrators that are well known saying, did you know that this weekend, only one out of three students is going to have a drink? to help normalize the alcohol behavior and the normal alcohol expectations of a campus. I also want to introduce Alcohol EDU as a resource. Um, at my campus, students take Alcohol EDU the summer before they start at university. Uh, alcohol EDU is an online module that helps students understand personal limits um, and, and how to help friends who are um, intoxicated, make good decisions in how to be responsible with alcohol versus bat uh, battling alcohol and, and its presence in the, the experience of, of a university. The final factor that, that really weighs heavily on student success is campus and community engagement. Some of the issues, uh, the inability to find the right fit for a campus that, you know, we mentioned uh, previously, the, the panelists previously talked about students, you know, accepting their fourth or, or fifth uh, choice for institutions and so not really feeling like they belong or that they fit in in that environment. Um, there are financial barriers to getting involved in campus participation activities. Um, students from historically marginalized populations may um, feel threatened or not comfortable engaging in campus activities or events if they have historically or from a population that has, that has experienced marginalization or feeling left out or targeted. Um, students living off campus is a threat to campus engagement. Uh, students who live off campus spend less time on campus, less time engaging with students, other students, faculty, and staff, and so that is, that is a risk area. And then the rise of online education, you know, again, it's similar to living off campus, is that if you don't, if you don't have to have the face-to-face -face interaction, you are less engaged and less connected to the, the feeling of the institution and the, the essence of the institution, which is what campus engagement is really all about. Some of the things that are proving effective thus far across many campuses in the U.S. are increased late night and weekend programs. So, if we're concerned about the party and drinking atmosphere, let's do an event on campus at 10 or 11 o'clock at night on a Friday night. Let's offer those alternatives to students who are looking for ways to be more engaged and involved. There's a greater emphasis on pre-first year orientation and training programs for new students. There are introductions of small groups in residence halls and classrooms. I'm going to talk more about small groups in just a few minutes. Um, there's increased specialized support for marginalized student populations on campus. On, on many campuses, there are specific offices dedicated to assisting students with disabilities, students um, from various uh, racial or ethnic uh, minority groups, um, different sexual orientation populations, campus religion and faith, as groups that have historically uh, felt marginalization on campuses. And then also, the power of community and service and uh, involvement. Taking students from the campus to contribute to the local community and environment and helping bridge connections between students in a very selfless way have proven to be incredibly effective. <clears throat> now, recognizing I just threw the, men the restaurant menu in your direction and said, here are tons of ideas and strategies. I know that it's a lot of information, and so I wanted to boil it down very succinctly for you. And that if I were starting a new job at a new campus, and I was responsible, as we all are, for student success, these are the 10 things that I would want to be in place, or I would ask questions about to make sure that student success is a top priority for the, the institution. Number one is I need to know the goals. What are the targets? What are we aiming for? The biggest mistake that I see campuses making is, you know, the idea of the, the target and an arrow being thrown? So when you think about a target and an arrow, you throw an arrow at the target. What I see campuses do, however, is throw the arrow and then draw the target 
around where the arrow landed. That's a big difference between aiming for something and throwing a throw and doing something and then seeing if it worked later. You want to know what you're aiming for by having those goals and, and metrics and measures set. Uh, it is very unlikely that you will be able to attribute a specific retention or graduation outcome to one specific strategy. And so don't think, if I do this behavior, I'm going to see a 2% increase in retention. Because remember, it's not about the spotlight. It's about multiple spotlights. It's going to take many different attempts and efforts, not just a single one. Um, the most successful way to measure what to start is, is asking your students when they leave, why they're leaving, to implement an exit interview. So in order for a student to withdraw from the university, to have a specific way, even if it's a paper form or an online form, doesn't have to be an interview. The most effective way would be have an interview with a staff member so that you can hear and learn the, the context of the reason and not just, I have to work or I've got to support my family. But you can get more information uh, from, your, from your campus, uh, from your student before they leave your campus. The other thing that I will say is that it is highly infrequent that it's your that some of the retention challenges your campuses will face are are just general they are likely very specific populations that you will notice having retention challenges and you have to do the assessment based on student demographics um, to make sure that you know what population are most at risk so on your campuses is it more likely, is retention of male students different than female students? Is your retention of students who have had a parent or sibling attend university better or less than students who have not had a family member or a sibling that's attended university? Looking at all of your special populations will highlight the specific areas where the most work is needed. And again, if you can shift the work in that direction, you will see dramatic improvements, not just in one year retention, but in the, the completion rates. So my first thing that I would want to do is to set the goals and to know the demographic audiences of where retention is a, is a concern. The second thing I would want to do or would recommend is to conduct a student fee audit. So we know the, the costs of attending campus are the big costs are relatively easy to determine. So one cost is tuition, another cost may be housing, another cost may be food. What we typically don't count in the cost of attendance is the money that it takes to get to campus, whether one time per semester or every day. That's a cost of attendance, your transportation costs. If there are book fees, laboratory fees, field excursion fees, uh, program fees. One of the things I would encourage you to do is to take a look at all of those places where $5, $10, $20, $30 may be charged to students to see how much they added up. On my campus, when we did this activity, it ended up being 10,000 US dollars every year in additional costs that aren't covered by government funding or don't, don't relate to their meals or their, where they're living. An additional 10,000 US dollars that it took to participate in education. And then developing strategies to say, okay, where can we help students subsidize some of these costs to reduce the, the um, importance of fees? We talked about emergency loan funds, and I know that there are campuses that have emergency loan funds. Um, what we found is that Typically, the, about the 1,000 US dollars is what's necessary to prevent a student who might have to withdraw for financial reasons. Now, the emergency loan fund covers um, the short-term financial needs of, of housing, transportation, food, books, you know, classroom experiences, that the $1,000 US dollar mark is about the amount that was needed from a, a, an emergency fund to keep a student from leaving the university. 
The other thing that we found effective is to make a connection between the loan that's given and another resource. So on our campus, what's most effective is the connection between alumni, uh, previous uh, individuals that have graduated, and using any donor money that is given directly to support student emergency loan funds. Therefore, they know the money that I'm receiving came from someone who went here and made it. There's a power to that, to that relationship. It's not just the university giving money, but this money came from someone who went here, graduated, and made it, and is now doing well enough to give back to my educational experiences. There's almost a pay it forward concept that happens there. The other thing that we're doing is linking emergency loans with campus jobs. And so um, students who are, are seeking financial loans most likely are the students that are in need of additional income from employment. And where possible, we link, if you receive a fund, with also with a campus job to help, to help make the financial burden um, less stressful. Fourth recommendation is to create a care team. Uh, the presence or existence of a student care to intervention team helps students build trust that the university cares for them individually. One of the things that I always say um, to my staff uh, in working with students is we all have a very basic human need, and that's I want to be a changed person because I'm here, and I want here to be changed because I was here. And the concept of a care team gives that individual attention that helps the students know, we see you, you're important to us, you matter, and your ability to come back to campus next term, next semester, next year, matters to us. So it's not just, I'm a better person because I'm a student here, but this place, this institution, this campus is better because I'm here. And the care team really helps to address that. The fifth recommendation is to identify and fill gaps in the calendar year of student communications when there's low student um, interaction with faculty and staff. Typically, summer is a huge period of lull where there's no communication or very little communication between faculty, staff, and students. And so what can be done during those low months to help the students know, we're expecting you back next, back next fall. We look forward to seeing you next fall. Here are some things for you to think about next fall to give the students something to look forward to, to look ahead to, and not just greet them when they come back from campus or come back to campus to register. That there's a relationship throughout the year, even in the times when students don't expect it. I give you two web links as resources to, sh to show you some ideas of ways to do this. Um, these are ones that my uh, university has done. If you can't see the text, I'll read it. It's american.edu slash provost slash year two. It's an interactive online video that helps students start thinking about what's going to be important to them in their second year, how to start seeking career guidance and resources that are going to be important to them as they continue on their degree. So I encourage you to look at those and, and I think you'll find some, some fun, interactive ways to engage students during those lull times in the, in the calendar year. I've already recommended number six is small groups for first year students. We talked about the, one of the greatest risks to graduation is not coming back after the first year. The way to help with that is to make small group interactions wherever possible within your area of responsibility. So whether it's a focus group, a meeting with students to get their feedback, to listen and hear about their experiences, to orientation groups, small group experiences in residence halls and in residence hall communities, small advising groups, counseling groups, um, and then small class sizes. The more that a person is noticed and present and can be seen and known in, in, you know, in a group, the more likely they are to feel a fit with the campus engagement. Students who participate in our small group activities, and by small group, I'm meaning a group no more than 24 students. 
So 24 is tend to be found the magic number for, for some reason of, of small enough to still deliver the program or services, but to also help students feel individual and recognized for participating. For students at American University who participate in our small group activities have an 8% higher retention rate first year to second year. So you saw the number, American University's 90% first year to second year retention rate most recently, that's 98% for students that participated in a small group or small, uh, small group as a new student. Number seven, I talked already about, develop peer outreach programs or campaigns. So we have a student group of students called the peer health educators, students that help students understand health and wellness. Um, uh, also, resident assistant positions, uh, where, where possible and, and uh, you know, in the context is correct for that. The more peer-to-peer -peer interaction you have, the more effective uh, you are in delivering uh, the, the service delivery of student development. Professionalizing advising. I talked before about uh, faculty members' primary role at, an, at a university is to teach and to help develop specialists and experts in, an, in a specific content area. And that career counselors, academic advisors, uh, and counseling center staff members should be professional, trained, and skilled in the delivery of advising um, and working with students. Um, you will see tremendous change in the delivery and continuity of services by professionalizing uh, advising. Invest in early warning programs, whether that is encouraging faculty members to offer an early grading option early in the semester, to reporting course attendance, to getting feedback from counselors and advisors who have talked with students or worked with students, as well as any type of online technology, surveys, map works, alcohol, EDU, whatever online, use technology to your advantage to help with early warning signs. I will also advise that just doing the early warning program isn't enough. There's an early warning and then a follow-up. The follow-up is what is most critical for, for reaching the student and making sure that they hear and understand that, that we are here for their success and want them to be able to continue. My tenth recommendation is to utilize and stay current on professional research and resources. Um, that's one of the reasons why uh, CTLPA puts on this breakfast seminar. It's why CTLPA does the summer workshop. It's why CTLPA is associated with the American College Personnel Association, College Student Educators International, because the network and the expertise that we all have together, it's about sharing, it's about networking, and not necessarily having to reinvent the wheel every time we run up against a challenge. There are other professionals and colleagues who have run up against very similar challenges, whether it's here in Trinidad, whether it's in Jamaica, with Ms. Henry or whether it's in the United States with myself. We've all run up against very similar issues and challenges and the more connected we are, the better able we are to deliver effective services. While we're talking about professional networks and resources, I do want to take time to talk about ACPA's 22 commissions um, that are profes have professional expertise in the ways in which you work. There is a commission for academic advising. There is a commission for student leadership and involvement. There is a commission for social justice educators. There is a commission for alcohol and other drug. So there are commissions, there are professionals whose job it is to do and deliver those services and content on campuses at your fingertips. Easy, from email listservs to um, special webinars and online courses. Um, there are also six standing committees that help recognize that the commissions are the work that you do. The standing committees are who you are in the way that you do your work. So there's a standing committee for men, there's a standing committee for women, there's a standing committee for graduate students and new professionals, and so on.
I also highly want to encourage you, if you're not already a member of the Caribbean Tertiary Person Level Personnel Association, to become a member. You've heard today about the power and of, of having this resource and staying connected and using each other as a strong force to support student success. So if you're not already a member, I highly encourage you to do so. Yeah. Got it. Okay, got it. Thank you. Um, the next, the next um, resource available to you are publications. Uh, the Journal of College Student Development is recognized as the top refereed uh, research publication for student, student affairs and services professionals throughout the world. There are people doing research, staying current on research, and we want your research and the work that you're doing to also be reflected in our publication. So know that there's written material and research happening every single day. That, that relates to your work. And then finally, there's professional development. Whether it's seminars, breakfast seminars like this, annual conferences and conventions, institutes that specialize in specific areas of focus, online webinars, and then good old fashioned networking and talking and sharing and learning from each other. I would be remiss if I didn't invite you to join us to future conventions. So we will be in Las Vegas, Nevada uh, this March. Uh, come on and to the party with us um, and, and, and meet other professionals who are engaged and are just as passionate about working with students as you are from around the countries, 28 different countries uh, from around the world. If it's too soon to come to Las Vegas, Start planning for, to come to us in, in 2014 in Indianapolis, Indiana, or 2015 in Tampa, Florida. I also have the absolute pleasure. You are all the very first people to learn about it, some exciting, something exciting that's happening in 2016. Um, the American College Personnel Association has always held its annual convention in the United States until 2016 when we are going to start living out the value of being an international association. Now, we're not going to be able to come to the Caribbean just yet. We want to. Um, but in 2016, I'm inc incredibly pleased to report that Montreal, Canada will host our 2016 convention and be the very first international convention of student affairs services and colleagues. Uh, so you are invited to join us in Las Vegas, Indianapolis, Tampa, or Montreal, or all of the above. And I look forward to seeing you at one of those future conventions. Uh, that wraps up my time with you. I hope that, that you've enjoyed the menu, that you have some things to think about, to taste, to talk about, and to share with each other um, as you go back to your campuses and go about the good work of supporting students uh, in their success. Remember, our effect is about persistence. We affect the desire and the actions that students take to help move them towards completion of their degrees. I would love to stay in touch with you. So I put my email address on the screen. If any of you are on Twitter yet, please feel free to tweet me. I've listed that there as well. So please, I, I hope that you will this, relation, this is just the start of a new relationship and that I would love to be able to, to assist and to learn together and grow together with you um, as you improve student success on your campus here in Trinidad as well as throughout the Caribbean. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moody. I mean, that was a really really captivating and I'm sure we would have taken a lot of notes to implement um, some of your recommendations when we get back to our higher ed institutions. I just want to take the opportunity of course to thank uh, Dr. Moody for making the journey here to the Caribbean. Um, I want to thank the University of Trinidad and Tobago for offering us this venue, the organizers of the conference, the media, um, all the staff who are on board from UTT for putting, pulling this together and of course you the participants for your presence here today. I want to welcome you now. Oh. Before we go to, to that last segment, we just have one thing to do, but uh, right immediately outside the building, you'd find a job and career coach. 
uh, this Senator Minister Karim would have indicated to you that he is on the verge of breaking through with the technology and really impacting student services. And the clear evidence of that is found behind those doors. Uh, we want to invite you all to go in and have a look at the Job and Career Coach, which is a mobile unit that offers advice on careers, etc., to uh, students, organizations. As a matter of fact, the minister was just saying they were at WASA this morning, so they made the, the trek here to enable you to um, see the good work that the Ministry of Tertiary Education is putting on. Uh, while we wait on um, the presentation, I'd just like to ask um, Dr. Moody if you'd like to throw out an offer for questions, maybe two questions. We just take two questions. And it's more a comment than um, than a question, but just to go back a little to the, our first presentation, I would like us to note that at least on my campus, the characteristic of the part-time student is changing, and I think it has to do with the downturn in the economy, so that a part-time student no longer is necessarily from five to nine, but a part-time student is found on the campus during the course of the day and is determined more or less by the number of courses that he or she is taking. And that will have, could have something to do with how we facilitate these students. The other is I would like to thank um, Mr. Moody for his presentation. And can you imagine if we have had so much in an hour and a half, how much you can get if you come to CTLPA or ACPA when you're going to be having about 400 and odd sessions to choose from at um, ACPA and probably about 30, 35 to choose from at um, CTLPA. What I would like to ask, however, Mr. Moody, is um, have you come across any statistics regarding the retention rate for residential and non-residential students? Because my campus is uh, spending a lot of money right now and trying to have more students housed on campus because um, you know we believe that it will be better regarding their learning and development. Absolutely, that's a great question. So just to make sure everyone heard the question, the question um, was related to, are we seeing, is there research that suggests that student, are there different retention rates from students who live in campus residences versus those that do not? Um, research dating back even to 1970s that's replicated multiple times since then has continually found retention rates are higher um, and typically statistically significantly higher for students who live in campus residences than those who do not. The reasons, access to faculty members is much higher, access to campus support resources, the library, academic advisors, academic learning professionals, counselors, um, residence hall staff and supervisors. The, this experience is more structured and the access to participate and access those resources is much better. Um, and so students who do live in residences do um, research-wise experience higher retention rates. I'll also add that students who participate in small group activities in residence halls, so if there's a floor environment, a floor environment of less than uh, 24 students on a floor, in a wing, in a certain area, students who participate in living learning communities like that have even higher retention rates than students who just generally live on campus. And so there's that added effect of the small cohort or the small group of students on top of students who already live on campus. So thank you for that question. Thank you, for Mrs. Henry, for that question. And so now we just move into a presentation. We just want to extend a token of appreciation to, Dr. to Mr. Moody. I'm going to ask the local CTLP president, Mrs. Logie Eustace, to make the presentation.
Thank you again. Once again, I invite you to visit the job and career coach, um, which is to the back of the, well, to the front of the, the hall, um, brought to you by the Ministry of Tertiary uh, Education and Skills Training. I want to thank you once again for being here today, and I wish you, on behalf of CTLP, a very safe journey back to your institutions. Thank you.